Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <coughs> welcome to the fifth lecture. Uh, okay, maybe we should do this side. Okay, so how is everybody doing with the assignment? No? <laughs> Well, the strategy should be, uh, you know, start your assignment as soon as possible uh, because you can't do it at the last moment. Um, I mean, if there are queries, then you should ask in the on the discussion board. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, no, then, then you'll uh, then it'll affect your project. The trade-off whether you want the fifteen percentage points or the forty percent points, right? Uh, okay, I mean, try to use the discussion board. I mean, your teams of three, so try to. Uh, uh, I think the strategy is to not waste time on synchronizing each other's schedule, like. Because that may also take up a lot of time uh, that when all the three of you are together and so on. Um, okay, anyway, so I just wanted to point out that it's in one week and uh, in three weeks project is also, project first report is due. So please read the instructions uh, uh, so that you can get started on that. I mean, given the assignment experience, your project first report should not be, uh, you know, uh, it's not you're not going to start from scratch. You'll probably reuse some of the things that you've already seen uh, to get to uh, jump start on your project. I I wanted to quickly uh, show an example. Uh, so for the last part of the assignment, I think there's a, there's the use of a uh, anyway there's the use of a pre-trained network. It's the VGG net, right? Um, Actually, so I'm just showing. Uh, I think I've I've uploaded this uh, notebook on on the lecture uh, on the course website as well. So all I've done is actually just uh, uh, taken somebody else who has kind of imported the VGG nets weights uh, and uh, uh, and and I've shown an example classification. So uh, here. Uh, you can see, I mean, so VGG net is a, is a really deep network. So you can see, at least in Keras's way of defining the network, uh, it's basically a very sequential way of, uh, it's called the sequential API and you kind of add, uh, uh, add layers. So you see there are a lot of layers. Uh, anyway, the, so this is from a, uh, so this is from a, a script uh, whose link is here, uh, which is also there on your web, course website, course material. Uh, so what I've done is actually maybe I can even run it. Um, <coughs> so so right now I'm trying to load this model. Okay, so you can see that here uh, I'm using uh, there's a file called vgg16 underscore weights uh, that's there in the current directory uh, on, in which this notebook is. So I'm just loading the weights, um, and so it's finished loading the weights. And now I can, uh, you know, for example, there's this uh, cats versus dogs data set, right? So here I'm just reading the, uh, um, reading one image from that data set uh, and just trying to uh, uh, use model.predict uh, function to uh, get the class, class, class uh, 
label, right? Uh, in fact, it's actually generating the score vector and from which I'm taking the index of the maximum element. And uh, I have this classes uh, list, which is just a list where the index corresponds to the string of what the class is, you know, the label actually. So, so in this case, since it's cats versus dogs, one of the images is going to be cat. So I picked some cat image and uh, you can see that this cat is classified as a uh, tabby. Okay. Uh, same thing. I just changed it to a dog. Um, run the same thing and I get this American Staffordshire Terrier and uh, you can look up uh, for example how they look like so this is how uh, American Staffordshire Terrier looks like uh, so so this was classified by ImageNet uh, uh, CNN as uh, as a as a terrier. It may be, I don't know whether this is the right classification for this dog. I don't know the true label, uh, uh, but it looks very similar. And same thing with uh, even even tabby, which is a certain type of a cat, right? So these are the tabby cats. Anyway, uh, just wanted to show that. Uh, of course, the pre-trained uh, weights are about. 500 MB in uh, size, so try to uh, get it from the directly from their website. I didn't upload it on the course website. Okay. Um, okay. So back to the lecture. Uh, so again, the timeline is today. We're going to look at try to uh, kind of understand some aspects of text data, which is the other big set of unstructured data that you'll come across in your uh, uh, you know in your projects and uh, and so on. And we'll look at uh, another neural network architecture called the recurrent neural network. Okay. So, uh, so today's outline is uh, we'll review what we discussed last time. Uh, a very 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 brief introduction to what is called natural language processing. When you deal with text data, uh, the the uh, kind of uh, term that we use is natural language processing. Uh, it involves a lot of different uh, research streams. Uh, uh, and one of the applications would be in text processing. Uh, we'll kind of uh, uh, discuss what is known as embeddings. Uh, in the last class, I decide I uh, kind of use the word embedding as a synonym for uh, the representation or the activation vector, right? The 4096 dimensional vector that was the output of one of the fully connected layers towards the end of uh, AlexNet, right? Uh, I was calling it uh, a representation vector or the CNN code or uh, the in I also use the word embedding. So we're going to look at text embeddings uh, today, and then we're going to discuss uh, this popular architecture called uh, recurrent neural network. Okay. Um, so quick review about transfer learning or, or using pre-trained uh, networks. Uh, basically, you get a pre-trained network, uh, uh, which which could be a CNN, which could be some other deep neural network. Uh, typically. Uh, uh, that network is trained for a certain type of task. If it's classification, that particular classification's output categories can be different from what you want to uh, use. So, um, what you do is just pass your current trained data uh, to uh, all the way to the end, maybe not till the scores vector, but uh, one layer before that to get uh, what are called embeddings. And then you can use those as basically the features of your input, right? Uh, so, that was the uh, idea here. And uh, uh, and why uh, and in the context of images, uh, it's if you look at some of the visualizations that we saw uh, in the previous two lectures, uh, these uh, layers somehow correspond to somewhat generic or somewhat local features, and these uh, represent more complex patterns, maybe more specialized to the data set where the CNN was trained on, right? Uh, so these are very useful, uh, more more transferable to very different image domains, okay. Uh, so that was just uh, the first part was just uh, using it uh, statically, getting a, uh, getting this embedding, and just using the embedding uh, in the next step uh, in in your own classifier. So instead of that, you can actually fine tune uh, some of the layers of the pre-trained network itself. Uh, like maybe you can freeze uh, up to up to this point, and and maybe start with the weights that you got from before, but kind of adapt the weights by doing backdrop uh, from uh, your. Uh, uh, by doing backdrop from your loss and your uh, uh, classes, which is the score vectors, to uh, till this point. Okay. 
and uh, uh, basically the idea is to not uh, you know so the we are trying to get rid of the myths that we need a lot of data to uh, get CNNs working in our applications and uh, this is a very uh, big advantage uh, 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 that so that uh, you know this technology is not limited to companies which have a lot of uh, compute power uh, you can also use it right uh, but sometimes transfer will not work when you have small data and it's a very very different data set so maybe medical data set and uh, ImageNet uh, uh, pre-trained network may not be compatible uh, you can try to experiment okay and uh, I just showed you uh, the VGG 16 on in Keras uh, but the, I think it's also available in other uh, uh, other software systems which we have not seen uh, in this class okay okay so uh, last week we also looked at a few techniques uh, uh, which kind of really help uh, train the neural network uh, better and uh, the three techniques that we, three of the few techniques that we saw were data augmentation, batch normalization and dropout. So augmentation is a very uh, straightforward idea. Here uh, we have an example x i y i. We want to create additional examples x tilde i y i where x tilde is uh, some kind of a transformed uh, version of x. Okay. So this uh, augments your uh, data and this is uh, uh, this actually is uh, used quite a bit in training modern uh, deep networks, uh, at, especially in image data sets. Um, so this was the uh, uh, example where I had an image, I kind of changed its color, uh, flip it uh, uh, and do some random crops and scaling and so on. And at test time I said uh, uh, you can do the same thing, uh, although you can, if your network is trained uh, for this image size, you can actually just get one label. But uh, it's been observed that people actually do cropping or do transformations on the test image as well and kind of pull the uh, uh, outputs to pull the predictions. Okay. So next uh, key uh, technique that we saw was uh, something called batch normalization. So if you remember and I think in your code, uh, code examples as well, uh, uh, it's uh, vector computations that are happening in the back propagation and forward propagation, right? Uh, so uh, of course, in the examples that I gave in in, in the second lecture, uh, uh, they were just very small data sets. So uh, uh, you could uh, use the whole uh, uh, all the examples in your data set to uh, forward propagate and back propagate. But uh, with really large image data sets, uh, you will have to take small batches. Uh, let's say as somebody was pointing out, uh, I have 55,000 or 70,000 images in MNIST. I'm not gonna create a 70,000 dimensional uh, uh, matrix of uh, X, right? Uh, the feature matrix. So, I maybe I'll take thousand images there, and then do a forward pass, forward pass, and backward pass, and then update my weights, and then I'll uh, take another set of thousand images and do uh, do my forward and backward pass, and so on. So that's the batch aspect of it. Um, and uh, here, the key idea was, if you are anyway going to do batch processing. Uh, we want to control uh, the activations at each layer to indirectly control the gradient flow. So if you, if okay, we are using batches of data to forward pass and backward pass, uh, but it's seen that in uh, uh, in in convolutional neural networks, uh, sometimes uh, because of your choice of nonlinearity and because of the choice of your initial weights, uh, sometimes. Uh, some neurons do not don't fire at all. You may have uh, gradients which are you know exploring, uh, and sometimes gradients going to zero. Uh, so to kind of facilitate this backdrop better, so that you are you are you are able to get to some good weight parameters, um, we are introducing this batch normalization technique, um, which is as follows. So you have this batch. Uh, so batch size is n. Okay. Uh, so and let's say there are D filters at the output of your uh, 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 output of your con layer. Then uh, let's uh, focus on uh, that one uh, fiber, uh, which was the orthogonal direction to the depth slice, right? So there uh, you can look at the output as a matrix, and then what you're just doing is uh, for each column or each filter, basically, uh, you are changing the uh, output by rescaling them by removing the mean and uh, dividing by the variance and multiplying with two numbers okay these numbers will be set uh, by again just like by, uh, by back propagation so so that the classification accuracy is is good okay um, so those are those are parameters of this back prop uh, sorry uh, batch normalization addendum that we are adding on top of a con layer okay 
So uh, test time since there is no batch, uh, you can uh, kind of you don't know what to plug in there. We said we can just use the training data means and uh, variances, which uh, you'll have to uh, you know meticulously keep track of as an additional thing. Okay. So ultimately, what we are saying is that okay, if we had originally a convolutional neural network like this, then we are gonna first add a batch norm in between and then do the nonlinearity operation. Uh, and this is empirically observed to facilitate better uh, learning of the parameters of, of your CNN so as to improve your classification accuracy. So uh, modern uh, uh, softwares like Keras or um, Keras can just, uh, you can just add a layer uh, which does batch normalization I think. Um, so it's very convenient. Uh, the last uh, technique that we saw uh, was uh, called dropout. Uh, it's a form of regularization. So the idea is very simple. Uh, during training, so every time you do a forward pass, let's say, for example, in the previous uh, slide we were seeing, you forward pass a batch of images. So you do a forward pass uh, and you set the uh, output of a few neurons to zero with some probability p. So let's say this is the hidden layer. Here I'm just showing a free forward neural network, but you can think of the same thing happening even if there was a con layer. Uh, all I'm saying is, uh, uh, setting the output uh, of a few neurons to zero is essentially saying that the neuron doesn't exist because it's no more contributing uh, 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 to anything uh, to the next layer, whether it's output layer or the next hidden layer, uh, whatever it is. Um, so, so this uh, we kind of uh, try to reason that uh, restricting it kind of by setting some of the neurons outputs to zero, we are restricting the capacity of the network in that forward pass. So it's essentially acting as a form of regularization. So regularization is a uh, way to introduce prior knowledge which is not there in the data or an another point of view is the same, same, it's essentially the same way as saying that I'm gonna restrict uh, the models which I learned because I have additional domain knowledge or uh, um, in this case we are restricting capacity of the net, uh, okay. Uh, and we are also forcing the neurons to be uh, redundant because in one forward pass some neurons may be, uh, neurons outputs are turned to zero and in another forward pass some other neurons may be uh, set to zero. And uh, at test time the question is okay now which neurons do I set to zero? If you don't set any of the neurons to zero you will see that the scores are not even in the same uh, range. So there will be, uh, in fact the factor is going to be p times. So scores will be um, p times more. Uh, uh, than what you should see. So, uh, so at test time, you are supposed to introduce this factor while going through each each layer. Okay. So this was these were the things that we kind of saw, saw last time. Uh, batch normalization, dropout, uh, and data augmentation can improve the performance of your uh, vanilla CNN. Not just improve the performance. In fact, uh, batch normalization and dropout can help you even train a good CNN. Whereas before that, you may end up with. Um, not being able to train your CNN, as in uh, things going to infinity, uh, seeing NANs and so on. Okay. Uh, the third part that we saw last time was uh, some engineering aspects that uh, when you really, really want performant uh, 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 neural networks, then uh, you want to focus on uh, vectorization architectures, uh, parallelism and precision. Uh, so vectorization is a very straightforward idea where uh, if we have a 3D tensor, uh, uh, then we are gonna, uh, and this, for example, is a, is in the receptive field of a uh, of a filter, uh, which is one of the depth slices. Uh, then, uh, then each filter is uh, made into a row. So each filter is actually a three cross three cross whatever is the input depth uh, size the uh, tensor, right? Is parameterized by that. So that can be made into a row. Uh, the the receptive field uh, with its own depth can be made into a column. And uh, even though there will be overlapping regions according to your stride and so on, you can still arrange them as co columns, arrange all your filters as rows and do one huge matrix multiplication. Okay. And so you can, so you, uh, instead of doing a stride as in sliding over your filter uh, one at a time over your image, in fact we are dealing with all the filters uh, with my uh, image or whatever input tensor at the same time. Right. Um, so we also saw some architectures but uh, we'll not go into the detail here, but uh, here is a plot uh, which kind of shows the uh, operations and the accuracy of uh, some of the modern uh, convolutional neural networks. So, uh, 
I think uh, this is uh, gigaflops. I, I don't really recollect the uh, x-axis, but uh, you can see that VGG uh, nets that we are looking at have really high uh, number of parameters, right? Uh, I think 160 million parameters. Uh, AlexNet has about uh, actually it's supposed to have 50 million parameters. Okay, so you can see that the accuracy, which is the top one accuracy, which is the actual. Uh, if you remember in ImageNet, we were showing top 5 accuracy. Of the 5 top guesses, if one of the guesses is correct as the object in that image, then we'll give it a uh, positive score uh, or, or plus 1. So instead of that, if you look at top 1 accuracy, uh, the best performing networks are about uh, between 75 to 80, okay, instead of 97, which is uh, uh, the top 5 best, top 5 accuracy was uh, uh, at par with humans, which was uh, I think 93 or 97, something like that. Um, so this is just showing, I think, the size of the network and uh, how good they are. Okay. Um, we also saw some notions of parallelism, uh, although just introduced that okay, there could be some parallelism <laughs> that we can uh, we can uh, uh, put in if we have a really large network. We can, for example, split the model itself. So some weights are here, some weights are there, and we have to exchange the gradients uh, in our forward forward uh, pass and backward pass, uh, or we can split our data itself and then. Uh, on the data, we'll compute uh, gradients, but then there has to be some synchronization uh, uh, in some other set of uh, machines. Okay. And finally, uh, we looked at precision. Uh, uh, it seems as if uh, for CNNs, you don't need a very high uh, precision uh, uh, computation of your matrix multiplications. Uh, so for floating point 16, uh, they've, they've shown uh, what is the time required uh, for, I think, the AlexNet sized, uh, uh, sized images. Uh, size, uh, yeah, input. Uh, 128 is the batch size, and this is the image size. Um, and uh, with smaller precision, they are able to improve, get gains in uh, uh, computation, and not deteriorate in terms of uh, classification accuracy. Okay. So, any questions with respect to the last lecture? Okay. So today uh, we look at. Uh, some parts of natural language processing. So, how many of you have already uh, have some experience uh, trying to deal with uh, text data? Okay, yeah. just three. Who has never touched text data as in in any form? Okay. okay. Uh, so, okay. So, people who have have a lot of experience, uh, uh, you can add to whatever we're gonna see here. Uh, so, NLP or natural language processing concerns uh, uh, all uh, aspects of uh, processing natural languages, uh, and we'll only in this uh, uh, lecture we'll only we're going to only look at a small sample or a very small uh, narrow set of topics today, and uh, uh, we'll be focused on uh, uh, trying to deal with uh, text, as pre more precisely words. Uh, words or characters are just symbols. So, very naively, you can represent them as uh, one hot encoded vectors. Uh, but we will see some better methods today. So, how many of you have seen or heard the, or, or know about one hot encoding? Okay, for, for others who have, are not able to map it to something you already know, it's, uh, if you remember, uh, in your training data, uh, uh, sorry, in your previous uh, experiments, uh, you had a score vector, right? So the network was outputting a, a score vector, let's say in the uh, CIFAR 10 data set, it was 10 cross 1, right? Uh, you would have another vector, I mean, I mean, you don't have, I mean, maybe not in terms of code, but in terms of understanding, you would have the true label, which would be 1 at some place and 0 elsewhere. So, it's basically uh, think of uh, giving an index to each of your uh, classes. So the airplane class will have, let's say, class one uh, will be uh, the airplane class will be indexed at the first coordinate, and so uh, its true label will be ones and followed by all zeros. And let's say the house class is somewhere uh, fourth, and so the fourth coordinate would be one and all zeros. So that would be a way to represent the true label. Okay, instead of just integers, I'm just representing it, it as uh, vectors here. Uh, and then I would have a score vector or 
uh, instead, you know, even function of score vector, which is the probability vector. So I would have, let's say, point, uh, point 0.8, uh, point 0.05, uh, point 0.15, and let's say all zeros. Uh, so this would be the uh, probability or, or, or uh, the sigmoid uh, operation on the score vector would give you this, right? Uh, then you can think of uh, kind of comparing these two. Like ideally, you want most of the probability. Essentially, this is a degenerate probability mass function, right? Where most, all the mass is on one coordinate, which is a true label, let's say the house. Whereas here, it's spilled over multiple coordinates, and here, it's uh, most of the probability mass is over here. Right, so this so forget about this, but this is uh, is essentially a one-hot encoding of your labels. Okay, so what do I mean by uh, representing a uh, text uh, text as uh, representing text as in text consists of let's say words uh, representing words as one-hot encoded vectors. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'll have a I have a bunch of words. Let's say I have uh, 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 some words, which is of uh, which is which comes from a vocabulary of size v. In the sense, uh, vocabulary would be all the words, right? A, uh, the, you know, school, order. So that would be the set of words. Uh, maybe I'll order them uh, lexicographically, as in just a dictionary way, the way it's ordered in the dictionary. And then I'll create a huge vector. Let's say the dictionary has, let's say the size of the vocabulary, which is represented, since V is a set, this notation is used to represent the size of the set. Let's say it's 50,000. In the sense, we have 50,000 words in our dictionary. Then I'll have a 50,000 cross one dimensional vector, where that uh, the coordinate of that uh, word would be one. So that this vector would be a vector that is associated with each word. Okay. Is that is that clear? One hot just means uh, so for for example here let's say there are three then for a there will be a one let's say here and zeros elsewhere and for b it will be zero one something like that. So how many of you uh, are confused with just this? Yes. We are assuming that the number of words in b. No, B is a vocabulary, so maybe there's a text, right? You uh, you have a, you know you know data dot text. Maybe maybe it's a it's a radio of a movie. Okay, it has uh, that. If you look at if you open data dot text in your notepad, then it has let's say hundred words. Okay, but let's say these words are from the English language, and let's say the English language has fifty thousand words. Okay, it has much more, but let's say it has fifty thousand words. Then I'm just saying that the vocabulary is the set, and I'm gonna for each word I'm just gonna uh, kind of uh, attach a vector, uh, which will have uh, one of the coordinates one and all the coordinates zero. So uh, of course this is not clear, right? So I need to set the words in in a certain order. Just let's say you open the English dictionary, that the way the words are, that's the way I have I have, I have the words. Then. Uh, whichever position, uh, let's say A occurs, that position I'm gonna set one. So that's a vector. That's one hot encoded vector for that word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For that, for this data, you'll have, uh, you'll have, you know, if you have hundred unique words, then you have hundred such vectors. Yeah, yeah. Each vector would be fifty thousand cross one. Whatever is the unique words in your data dot text, whatever is then you will kind of use those 50 uh, uh, vectors in some way. But we'll see uh, how we're going to use that later. Any other confusion? Yeah? So are we not taking frequency or like, like Not yet. I mean, so this, is all, so this is all design choice, right? You have symbols, which are, these are symbols, or, or you can say collection of symbols, because you can think of the character itself as a symbol. You can do whatever with the symbols. We, we ideally want to process the symbols in a nice way. So, I just said, okay, one way to do it is maybe with each you know, specific collection of symbols, I'm going to make a vector with that point being one. Now, in this, I may have multiple words, right? Let's say uh, uh, T-H-E may appear multiple times, uh, A may appear multiple times. Uh, what am I going to do with that? Um, we'll see, depending on the task. So. V is for unique words. Like, yeah, it's a set, so it's unique. Elements of set, set. 
So actually, we are not going to go uh, too much into the conventional methods in uh, natural language processing. So you can, uh, yeah, you can do a lot more uh, than just this representation, but we'll see. Okay, so right now I'm just going to motivate uh, some applications, you know, uh, which uh, build on the thing that we're going to see next, which is the recurrent neural network. So first is uh, what is called machine translation. Uh, so some of you might have used Google Translate or uh, some other translation services. So here you can translate uh, a sentence in one language to another language. Okay. Uh, and the way, uh, uh, so once you have a sentence which is, uh, for example, has a bunch of words, then you need to have some sort of intermediate representation, for example, a one-hot representation or something else, and then you need to process it and somehow be able to predict the equivalent uh, sentence in the other uh, language. Okay, so this is actually a, a prediction task. You know, input is uh, x, output is y. I mean, previously in classification or image classification, we were thinking of y as just labels. Here, y is actually a sentence. Okay. Um, another motivating ex example of uh, uh, text uh, uh, analytics or text application is. Uh, is query answering. So if there's a huge uh, piece of text and uh, and then you want to run some queries on this text uh, and want to get the answer, then there has to be a way to kind of deal with all these symbols, right? These words, uh, uh, so as to make sense of what was the question asked and what should be the right answer, okay? Another application is uh, uh, speech to speech. Uh, just think of the uh, machine translation example that we saw two slides ago where we were trans translating from English to Spanish, right? Now, let's say there's an additional layer that you're actually, somebody speaking in English, you're able to do uh, automatic, sorry, uh, yeah, automatic speech recognition and uh, uh, get, okay, this is some other language, but uh, get the text, uh, and then you do the machine translation, let's say using Google Translate type of method, and then you also trans uh, transfer the uh, text back to speech, okay? So to do all these steps, each is a functional transformation. So you can kind of use uh, the notion that we saw, like we will fit parameters such that this, trans this transformation is possible. That's the high level idea. I mean, we'll get to what the, how to do that uh, soon. Another uh, application is visual query answering. So here the domains themselves are different. So instead of text, we have, a, we have let's say a video feed or an image and uh, and then uh, at test time, you can ask, uh, you know, what is, who is in, you know, what is in the uh, picture, for example, you can do object classification or detection. And then depending on that, uh, you know, you can ask additional questions. And I think this last question has uh, really, uh, is, is, is tougher than the other ones because there has to be some notion of, you know, what is vision for, for this object, you know, what is the quality of vision and so on. So uh, these are, these are all, have been achieved in research, or at least research prototypes, and so we will see some very basic version of uh, them uh, today, okay? And then there are much, much harder text problems in natural language processing, which current uh, attempts uh, are not able to uh, kind of capture. Uh, for example, what is the sense in this, uh, in this sentence, you know? Did you, you know, like uh, ducking like this, or is, is there actually a duck? Okay, um, and then uh, idioms like uh, he, kicked the, he kicked the goal versus uh, he kicked the bucket. Okay, uh, there's slight changes from this sentence to this sentence, but this really means something else. And also uh, there uh, issue of reference that the ball did not fit into the box because it was too big or small. Uh, now, it was too big means the ball was big. It was too small means the box was small. So there is this uh, ambiguity uh, which I think uh, current methods are uh, maybe failing to capture. Um, okay, so what I'll do is try to get to the next topic and then we'll kind of keep uh, text as a running example, right? So any questions so far? Is it completely, um, it's not clear 
I mean, I, I just gave you a very naive way of representing text, okay? Whether this representation makes sense or not, we'll see. I mean, you can use this representation to do your classification. For example, uh, sentiment classification you might have heard of, where you have a, uh, let's say, a, a review or something posted online, or maybe a Twitter uh, a tweet, and you want to classify whether it was a positive tweet or a negative tweet, right? So maybe you can just uh, represent that as this, and maybe you can use this these vectors, the bunch of vectors in that uh, from that tweet or from that data, and uh, do a cl regular classification. You can do that by just using these types of representations. Any questions? Okay. So let's uh, look at embeddings, uh, which are going to be uh, the reason why I talked about one hot encoding was because embeddings are going to be very similar to this for every. Uh, word there is going to be some other vector okay that's the if you don't understand anything for the next section uh, just understand that for every word we are just creating a different vector okay then then this one hot encoding vector okay so what do I uh, mean by embedding we have already seen uh, image embeddings right uh, for every image I could create let's say the 4096 dimensional vector so an embedding uh, I'm gonna call a function which maps words to uh, a vector space, uh, right? So an embedding is going to be this function. So I'm going to uh, uh, call this uh, an embedding, and uh, n can be let's say 300 dimensional or or something else. So here I said with one hot en uh, one hot encoding, uh, the dimension has to be the same as the vocabulary size. But here I'm going to say okay, I, I want an embedding which has an arbitrary uh, uh, size uh, dimension. So I don't have to use 50,000. Let's say I want to choose 300. Can I do that? Uh, we'll do that actually. And so example, uh, this function you know takes a word and out, spits out a vector, right? Um, and so why? Uh, so once once we get these uh, vectors. Uh, these are like the features of the word, right? So if the word was present in your in your data, uh, for example, let's say there was a positive word, good, good is a po positive word, let's say, if you would have a vector corresponding to good. Uh, and if good was present in that uh, text, then you use the use the vector in your classification pipeline. And hopefully that, that vector, since it's like a feature, since that feature is present, hopefully you can classify your um, input as uh, positive or negative. Right? So you can see if we had these vectors, then maybe there's a way to get to use them in your classification pipeline and uh, you know do classification, the usual way that we saw in lecture zero, right? So instead of classification, let's, we'll just focus on trying to create these vectors. Okay, these are here. These are one-hot vectors, uh, which are very sparse, right? Each each one-hot vector has just one one, and everything else is zero, right? It's very sparse. So we'll create. Uh, um, something else uh, which are going to be some good embedding. So this is also an embedding and we'll create some good embeddings and uh, uh, the way we're going to kind of learn an embedding is we'll start, uh, uh, you know, we'll start with a function or a w uh, which outputs random vectors for each word, okay. So let's say I picked, uh, uh, I picked n is equal to 300, uh, then for each word I'll create a 300 dimensional uh, vector, okay. Is there an issue with uh, uh, overlapping vectors? Because I just changed, uh, I mean, I have, let's say my vocabulary size is 50,000. If I only create a 300 dimensional vector for each word, will, will two words have the same vector? Huh? Huh? No, no, I mean, I think uh, there's no restriction, right? I didn't restrict. So there's not going to be any, I mean, there no, need not be any overlap in the sense, of course, we are constraining a dimension, but each word can still have a unique vector, right? Because these are real numbers. I can always, they're, they're much more than 50,000. Anyway, uh, uh, so w is this function, right? So this w, w function will have parameters. And what we're going to do is initially we start with some random vectors and we'll change these parameters such that uh, the vectors are meaningful for a task, okay? Uh, if let's say, my task is sentiment classification, then I will, you know, ideally I want to use vectors which will help me do the sentiment classification task really well. My accuracy should be high. Um, 
So what I'm saying is we'll start with random vectors, but we'll kind of update the parameters of this function such that I can actually do that sentiment classification really well. Okay. Um, so we'll actually run through a specific uh, detailed task and see how these uh, uh, vectors make sense. So let's say, uh, so, so actually we want to learn a good W, right? But it's not clear how to learn a good W. I mean, I have a, I have data, uh, let's say I pick a language, English. I have, I know how many words are there, let's say 50,000 or 500,000. Uh, how do I create good em a good embedding? It's not clear. I mean, my objective is to just create an embedding, but uh, uh, it's not clear how to do that uh, beyond this what I've done, right? Uh, I can, of course, always randomly assign a 300 dimensional vector to each word, but that may or may not be a good embedding. So what we're going to do is uh, try to define a task for which the embedding is going to be uh, good. And uh, hopefully, we'll, def we'll define a temporary task for which the embedding will be good, and then we'll ignore the task and hope that the embedding is good in general. Okay. Is that, is that, does that make sense? If you remove the task, how will you say the embedding is good? Yes, so if we'll qualitatively say that the embedding is good, if it can be reused in some other task. Okay. It's like, uh, remember in transfer learning, we were using the pre-trained CNN to get the representation of an image, right? Now, I said we'll use the pre-trained uh, network uh, to get a representation for a different data set that I have. If the, if the representation is still good, in terms of like, let's say, classification accuracy, uh, then I'm fine, right? So the pre-trained network is like a embedding function W in, in the image, uh, image domain case. Uh, here we're gonna define W, which is gonna map from words to vectors. In the pre-trained uh, CNN case, we were mapping images to uh, vectors. Can you give an example for this embedding? Yeah, this was an embedding, a very trivial embedding. We're gonna learn, uh, uh, is this embedding clear? Yes. Okay, let's say I change from 50,000 to uh, 300. Uh, I can still create vectors. I'm, I haven't shown you the vectors here, but I can still create ve some vectors. Whether they are good or bad depends on uh, the task that they are used in, right? Like embeddings by themselves are just representations of text. Uh, once I represent the text, if I use it for classification and I'm getting a very bad accuracy, then that representation of text is not good. Like this representation of text, I can use it for classification, right? Like presence, this is like a indicator indicator uh, feature. It says whether the text has uh, the word uh, D in it, whether the text has the word A in it. Maybe if it's a positive <laughs> review, there will be a word good or excellent in it, right? These are features, essentially. Yeah. So when you say classification is good or bad, yeah. so what are you basically classifying? That's what we wanted. So that's why it's not clear yet. So. Uh, in sentiment classification, we are trying to classify whether the input text blob is a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment, right? So, uh, when we say that we have to learn the embedding, yeah. can we only learn the numbers or are we going to learn the dimension as well? No, we'll fix the dimension, let's say 300, and we'll learn uh, for each word what is the vector that corresponds to it. Yeah. We'll actually not see too much about actually in detail of how to learn the embedding itself, but we'll try to justify what is meant by uh, an embedding and what is meant by a temporary task and how to generalize it. Right? So even though there are 3,000 words, yeah. we can represent it as a 300 size uh, vector. Each, each, word in that, in, each word in the vocabulary will be represented as a 50, uh, let's say, will be represented as a 300 dimensional vector. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. The number of vectors will still be the same as the number of words. But it's just that each word is represented as a 300 dimension vector. Yeah. So, 300 dimensions related to that word in some way? Yeah, yeah, they need to capture the word in some way, right? Um, so, we'll get to how, you know, what do they capture about the word? Like, this captures that there is a word of that type, that's all. It doesn't say anything else. Let's say here it was a cat and a dog. There will be an indicator vector, I mean, there will be a vector with uh, one at the cat position and one at the dog position. That doesn't say anything about both are, uh, you know, pets or both are animals or something like that. There is no additional notion. So, but there is some very degenerate uh, capturing that there exists a word called cat, there exists a word called 
uh, dog in my in my input. So so we're gonna uh, try to change the parameters of an embedding such that it's uh, you know it's meaningful for a task. So let's pick a arbitrary task. Okay. So we're gonna train a network or a classifier to classify whether an input sequence of five words is valid or not. Okay. So so what is the what is the classification pipeline? Uh, I need a classifier such that it's going to output valid or invalid, so two classes, right? And the input is going to be five words, right? A sequence of five words, so something. So this has to be the input and that has to be the output. This is a classification task, right? Um, in the input sequence, uh, I think the technical jargon is n gram, five gram, okay? Uh, so, so let's say we get uh, data from let's say Wikipedia. So if you go to UIC's web page, then it says operates the largest medical school. Some some part of the text, okay? Then, uh, so so this is supposed to be a valid uh, five gram, okay? valid valid uh, sequence of uh, words. Now let's say think of the data augmentation technique. I'm gonna randomly uh, change. Uh, 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 one word in this from the re from the rest of my vocabulary, then it means with very good probability it will not be a valid sequence of words, right? Um, let's say I changed. Uh, uh, I think here I changed uh, largest with consistently, and then this is not a valid sequence of words. So so I have this as input, and I know the label which is valid. This as the input, and I know that uh, invalid is a label, right? So I'm just I augmented the data by first picking all the valid sequences, which will be all pretty much all sequences in, in, in your input text corpus, let's say Wikipedia. Then uh, how, how am I actually going to execute my uh, uh, classification pipeline? The whole point of, yes? By valid do you mean it should have the same meaning or it should have some meaning? It should have some meaning, right? There is no meaning. I mean, in a sense, these strings make, uh, make sense. No, no, I mean. You could replace largest by smallest. It would still have meaning, but it would be. Yeah, but replacing largest by smallest is very low probability, right? There is uh, many, many other no, words. I'm asking whether by valid do you mean that it should have meaning or it should have the same meaning? Ideally, should not have meaning. So let's say you have you were able to create hand create uh, five word strings uh, which were invalid in any sentence, mm -hmm. then you can just add that data here. Doesn't have to be this way. I'm just creating a positive class and a negative class, right? So, so how would the classification pipeline look like? You pass uh, pass each word uh, through uh, this embedding uh, function w to get the vectors, and pass the vectors through a classifier uh, to get this valid invalid. So the whole point of the embedding is to get some representation, a numerical representation for <coughs> these for these words, right? Now, how I'm going to use those? Let's say in this case I have five vectors. How am I going to use those words? I can naively, for example, concatenate them to get uh, 300 times, let's say five. Dimensional vector. I can add them to get uh, just a three-dimensional, three-hundred-dimensional vector, and just do uh, your regular feed-forward neural network. Uh, let's say even SVM or something like that to get uh, the label. Um, and in order to do uh, this classification correctly, parameters of W and C should be good, right? Uh, in the sense, they, of course, the classifier's parameters have to be correct. Otherwise, uh, you know, you can't randomly initialize the parameters of your classifier. Uh, you can initialize, but you'll have to set. You know, you'll have to uh, do some backdrop or some gradient uh, descent to figure out the good parameters for the classifier. You can also actually set the parameters of W such that the whole uh, uh, pipeline is is a good classification pipeline. Is that clear? So, what if I put Ws inside here and made this a huge block? A uh, huge block. Then this huge block would have. Uh, both the parameters of the classifier and the parameters of uh, W as well, right? Then it's as good as saying, I have this input, I have this output, I can do, uh, 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 I can set my parameters such that uh, for this input I do get uh, valid most, you know, uh, as much as possible and for incorrect inputs I'll get invalid as much as possible. That's the classification objective and I can change the parameters such that I, I, I do that for any test sequence of, let's say, words, right? So all I'm saying is this this had parameter for numbers. This had parameter. We knew how to up, up, update the parameter. I've just added another block which also has parameters. 
and I'm saying that those parameters can also be updated such that this task is, uh, uh, you know, this task achieves a good uh, classification accuracy, let's say. Yeah. So if you give the, give the sequence of the six, five inputs, like operates the medical, largest medical hospital, yeah. the hospital is supposed to be valid, right? Yeah. So like when you're training the model, how will you get an example for it valid? That's what I said, right? You randomly replace a, okay. the augmentation part. Uh, okay. Just replace a random word, and then this would be highly highly likely that it's an invalid <laughs> input. Um, I mean, the task itself is uninteresting and consequential because uh, you know who cares whether a string of five words is uh, valid or not. I mean, there could be more other many many other more interesting classification problems that you want to solve. Uh, and we could have defined a different task, but uh, because we defined a task like this, a, 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 a class, an example of a classification task, we can kind of bundle in uh, updating parameters of W such that we learn a good W. Okay, It's, it's just like a, an additional layer in your uh, feed forward network. As long as this, uh, you can pass the gradients back all the way to the input, you know, as in get the gradients of this parameter with respect to the final loss, then you can actually update these parameters as well so as to achieve good classification accuracy, right? Is that... Uh, no, there's one, one function which operates in words, right? It inputs words, outputs vectors. So all these have the same parameter. I've just replicated it, but um, they're just used five times here, right? So is it, uh, I mean, it should not be completely clear how, how to update, how to get a good embedding, but it, it should be kind of clear that it's just like uh, an additional layer with parameters and I need to update those parameters as well to achieve a good classification in this classification pipeline, right? Like I could have divided this classifier into layers where each layer had the W comma B parameter, right? And then I would do backdrop to update the parameters of those individual layers. Same thing with an additional uh, block which is between the real input uh, all the way to the final label. Yeah. If you have, like, suppose the words repeat, you can have two those in that. Yeah, that's fine. So then, uh, do the vectors remain the same for both of those or they can be different? They should be the same. I mean, it's a deterministic function, right? It's a function. W is a function. Okay. So, they'll be the same. Okay? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to think of W as a function. In fact, you can stack all these uh, vectors and call that a W, but we'll see that uh, later. Or we can even see that. Where do I keep all my? Uh, so one way to kind of uh, uh, define this function W is, let's say I. So this W is supposed to give me vectors, right? In let's say 300 dimensional space. Then I can actually think of a W as a matrix, roughly, uh, where I'm gonna just uh, stack all the, uh, let's say I have vocabulary size of 50,000. So this is gonna be my uh, W. In the sense I'll have these many parameters. In a sense, each row of W is uh, a representation of a word, as an embedding for a word, right? So, for example, uh, uh, yeah, this this embedding can be for A, this embedding for embedding for T, uh, sorry B, and so on. So, so this would be three hundred dimensional. Okay. So, if you don't want to think of W as a function, you can just think of W as a as a container which has all these vectors, it's just that I don't know these vectors. So I can as well think of the coordinates of these vectors all as parameters. Okay. And so if I'm going to learn uh, a good W, all it means is that uh, I've, I have arbitrarily created a task here, but for this task, I'll ensure that, you know, if A gets, uh, you know, whatever, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 300, all these numbers are such that my, uh, my, uh, when A appears appropriately in a five word sequence, then it has to be valid, right?
Okay. Yeah. So, are we actually taking the whole theorem and as a text that we are processing and we are training it or are we... No, no, this is a very kind uh, uh, particular classification pipeline where, we, where our data set consists of sequence of five words and a label which says whether the sequence of five words is valid or not. So, so initial data whether it was a, you know, let's say it's a Wikipedia document which has 2000 words, let's say in the document. Every five sequence I will keep moving and every five sequence I will say it is a valid sequence and I will kind of randomly change some words and say it is an invalid sequence. That is my data set. And for this data set I want to build a classifier. Yeah. So, we are not removing any top words or those? No, no. I mean of course all those are there. Free processing of... I mean, while training it is not a uh, considered like removing the top words. Uh, so, those depend on the particular application. Here I am just trying to motivate embeddings as this maps you know just like in CNNs we had pre-trained networks to get from image to a vector same thing here we have a, we, ha we have a pre-trained uh, something called embedding to get from a word to a vector yeah. uh, the removal of pre-processing post-processing of uh, stop words and stuff such that depends on the application yeah let's not let's say we have all the words and we only have words no extra symbols and so on let's say Um, so, say uh, we learned uh, a good W and in fact, uh, if you have heard of these keywords word to vec and uh, glow, okay. Yeah, this one, yes. No, there is no words. Each row is uh, a vector for a word, that is it. I have just tagged them. One after the other. So, I mean, something. I mean, just like each column here represents a one hot indicator feature for the, whether that word is a, uh, let's say, A or not. Here, there is no particular interpretation for each column. Yeah. Uh, so, here, the input data set that we are giving, right? Yeah. So, the, the, the 5 gram sequence that we are checking, we are checking to see if it is grammatically correct. Yeah, I mean, uh, if it's a, if it exists in let's say a document like Wikipedia, it is correct. Yeah, we are assuming that it's correct, and so we are giving it a label valid. Yeah. So uh, each of those alphas, each yeah. of those dimensions. Right? Yeah. So you can think of them as trying to model some grammatical rule for a word. Yeah, let's yeah something like that. Yes. Uh, not exactly grammatical rule. So maybe for these words, it's kind of hard to kind of understand. Uh, let's say a word like uh, largest, right? We saw in one of the five uh, example. So, if largest appears in, in my input sequence, uh, largest will have a vector representation, right? It should be that when largest appears, the co-occurring words are such that, you know, I mean, largest is used in the appropriate way such that the classification is valid, okay? These, these additional, these parameters will be, uh, will be such that uh, uh, if largest is used in appropriate way, uh, it will be valid. So, we will get to that actually. Um, okay, so I said, okay, let's say we learned a good W, I mean, somehow, um, let's say we did just big, did back propagation. Uh, in fact, uh, I think in Keras, in the sequential API or when you create a, a neural network, you can do m model dot add embedding, okay, and that will kind of put that W block in your, in your uh, 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 classification pipeline. Uh, so there are pre-trained uh, uh, embeddings called word to vec and glow. Actually, word to vec is two different uh, subtypes of embeddings, but you can think of them as <coughs> pre trained uh, embeddings. As in, what do I mean by pre trained embeddings? They have, they say, they have processed the English language on some huge uh, data set and they have created uh, representations for each word. Right? That's it. When I say pre trained uh, embedding, it's just these vectors for each word that they'll give. Okay? Uh, so, let's say we learned some. Uh, embedding, uh, we can visualize it, right? It's a high dimensional uh, vector for each word. So, we can always project it down, right, into two dimensions and try to see how the words look like in 2D plane. Just like we did for uh, the CNN, the images, we try to project the representations of the image onto the 2D plane and see whether if the image was of the same thing, hopefully they are close by in the projected two dimensional uh, plane, right? So, TSNE was one of the techniques to do that. Um, how many of you actually looked up what TSNE was? Um, 
so it's like uh, PCA where it's a uh, PCA is a is a linear uh, projection onto the low dimensional uh, space uh, this is a more involved uh, uh, computation but it kind of try to tries to preserve that if two vectors are uh, close by uh, in the high dimensional space let's say in, in this 3000 dimensional space then they are somewhat close by in the two dimensional space or three dimensional space okay um, so here actually you can't actually see anything actually but in the slides you can see that this was a plot generated by somebody who who created some embedding and uh, uh, kind of plotted uh, in two dimensions where the words all fell uh, so I'm gonna anyway zoom in so don't worry so I'll zoom into two, two regions uh, anyway so so I zoomed into some parts of that low dimensional embedding in, in the sense the two dimensional plane where they projected all the words okay so they had for each word I think they, they had a high dimensional representation let's say three di 300 dimensional representation uh, and they projected all the 300 dimensional vectors down to two dimensions and that was the previous plot and I have just zoomed into two regions okay uh, if you see uh, so in one region you can see that all these correspond to numbers and in the other region uh, this correspond to uh, months and days of the week okay so it looks like this word uh, this is Saturday and Sunday uh, they are projected to almost the same area in the two dimensional representation so there is a good chance that they were close by the vectoral representations were close by so if a sentence had Sunday or Saturday uh, it would have like a similar vector okay it wouldn't change uh, let's say the classifier wh whatever purpose it was being used if you really wanted to disambiguate Saturday and Sunday that's a different question but uh, for whatever task this, this embedding was uh, learned for uh, it's such that it's able to kind of uh, uh, put together uh, similar vectors for similar concepts okay previously remember uh, in the one hot encoding let's say this was for a cat and this was for a dog it didn't matter whether uh, this vector had a one here or at all the way to the end okay there was no relationship between the cat and the dog vectors in the sense if you take an inner product or if you think of a distance uh, it's going to be the same distance right it's, a, it's in fact the same distance for all all vectors right so what is the distance between uh, these vectors yeah so <coughs> Uh, there's no like cat and a dog are similar and dissimilar because the, the difference is two and uh, huh? root two yeah root two and uh, uh, a cat and a house is also similar because the distance is root two so it really did not capture some uh, some interesting aspects of the cat word and the dog word whereas like for example here Saturday and Sunday uh, they have captured that right uh, the distance between Saturday and Sunday is much smaller than the distance between Saturday and let's say 5 right so that's what uh, is interesting about this, these embedding okay in fact uh, you can also kind of uh, understand whether the embedding is good or not by looking at uh, uh, the words closest to uh, closest in the embedding to a given word so you can just do nearest neighbor search let's say you pick a word and say what are my nearest neighbors in this uh, 300 dimensional space right uh, so the nearest neighbors are listed here for uh, you know it was not easy to create this embedding but somehow they created this embedding for some task by attaching a some task just like we did with the 5 gram thing and uh, then they saw uh, uh, what uh, words were closest to let's say a particular word uh, here these numbers just represent how frequent the words were for example megabits is very infrequent and France is very frequent in that corpus whatever on that data set anyway so this kind of tells you the quality of the embedding in the sense of they're able to capture that the closest words to uh, this France vector uh, are the vectors which correspond to other countries, right? Um, okay. So the question is: Is it natural for words with similar meanings to have similar vectors? Uh, like uh, if you change the uh, operates the largest medical school to operates the biggest medical school uh, if W maps biggest and largest very close to each other then the classifier should be still able to you know kind of say that the output is valid right um, so that's good that uh, similar words uh, get mapped to uh, close by vectors but 
it's not that just similar words are getting mapped to, uh, close to each other. There's also, uh, um, you know, we're not limited synonyms. For example, we saw Saturday and Sunday are not synonyms, uh, but uh, they are similar. So similarly, for example, in this case, let's say the five uh, gram was inside uh, wall is blue uh, to the inside wall is red. Uh, it's both are valid. Uh, both are valid uh, five grams, right? So for both of them, the output is valid. So uh, what this would uh, create is, uh, um, you know, red and blue would be uh, uh, would have similar vectors in the sense of very close by vectors. Even even a word like if you change the wall to uh, uh, ceiling, uh, it would still have ceiling and uh, wall would have. Uh, I mean, the meaning would not sorry, not the meaning, but this. Uh, sentence this five gram would have would be valid and this five gram would also be valid although I replace two vectors there because the vectors are very close to the let's say the wall and uh, blue vectors okay so it's not synonyms is what I want to say in this slide uh, so these types of embeddings are good and we we were we were not clear how to get good embeddings all although one way to get good embeddings was we created a arbitrary uh, auxiliary uh, uh, classification task and we train we could train uh, since w also has parameters we could train the parameters by you know similar backprop or gradient descent to change the parameters right so that was one way to get the embeddings we were we are now trying to kind of evaluate some uh, pre-existing embeddings of what is meant by a good embedding if they kind of capture the context more than what we saw in one hat, one hot encoding maybe they are maybe they are good right and how much uh, 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 data do we need? Clearly, we have to see all the words because you know if we want to create a vector for a word, then I need to know what the word is, right? Uh, but we did not see. Uh, we don't have to see their combination. So we might not have seen uh, uh, you know operates the largest uh, medical hospital to operates the biggest medical hospital. You might not have seen the second uh, second five gram, but you can still uh, kind of create a vector for. Uh, the word largest and the biggest such that they are close by, okay? Because uh, because that's what leads to good classification accuracy, okay? Um, so I mean, this is similar to humans where we have seen all the words, but we have not seen all the sentences with those words, right? Um, and uh, some good embeddings also have the following property, which uh, was made popular in the in the uh, popular media as well. Uh, uh, that embeddings exhibit the following property of the side effect, which is that analogies are encoded in different vectors. As in, if you actually plot, let's say, uh, these uh, six words, uh, let's say there were 300 dimensional representations for them, and I projected them down into 2D plane, uh, they would look like this, let's say. Or actually, you can just imagine in 300 dimensions, they would look like this. In a sense, uh, they would be spatially such that uh, they would all be oriented in the same direction. So you could actually do vector math to get to uh, uh, from one point to the other, like you can subtract uh, the woman vector from the uh, sorry man vector from woman, woman vector and add it to the uh, aunt vector. Okay, aunt minus uh, yeah. So this is what it, it would look like. So the vectors would be very similar is what what this is saying, right? Uh, same thing with uh, uh, this. So this was not kind of. Uh, this was learned as a side effect. We were not trying to figure out embeddings which would have uh, similar analogies, uh, you know, analogies, analogies captured as different vectors, right? Similar different vectors. Uh, so, so some people worked on it maybe in 2013, and uh, uh, for the embedding that they created with their corpus, uh, they saw that uh, uh, you can you can do vector arithmetic uh, to get another word. For example, here, uh, uh, like. To get any of these other examples, you have to just subtract uh, the first item minus the second item, plus add the first item of the um, other examples, right? So, so you could do this not just. Uh, uh, I mean, this is just a difference of vector property. Uh, vectors property being illustrated for a very very different type of words, right? So this was a, a side effect of good embeddings. Um, so, embeddings represent unstructured data, right? I mean, we have already seen image embeddings and we have tried to kind of understand what word embeddings are. They are just representations of words as vectors, symbols as vectors. Um, 
And uh, once a word embedding is learned, let's say with some auxiliary task, uh, uh, we can use it for, I mean, the whole point is that we, we not just we can, that we ideally want to use it for other uh, natural language processing tasks. And that's uh, essentially the same as transfer learning, right? The feature extraction, yeah. Uh, two One question is about uh, the embeddings and learning. Yeah. And the difference to show the analogies. Is it, is it applicable on MNSO? <coughs> Uh, so okay, so images, image embeddings are somewhat different than word embeddings uh, in the following way: words are fixed, right? But images, uh, they are uncountable number. So uh, you will not find the difference of vectors. Uh, type of property in image embeddings. Um, I mean, you can try, but for words, uh, so that's why if you remember the pre-trained, uh, uh, so when I wanted to get the image embeddings, I was giving you a pre-trained network of weights. Uh, when I want to get the word embeddings, for all words, the vectors are already there. I don't have to give you a weight, you know, I don't have to give you a network which when you pass your word through will give you a vector. Right? These are the vectors themselves. They are like universal vectors compared to uh, the image embeddings which for which you will have to actually have to use a CNN, pass the image through and get the uh, embedding or the vector. Is that clear? This is a yeah. Uh, we talked about just the difference between the vectors and how yeah. are there other properties like getting the angles between the vectors and that could mean something else? Uh, this was just a side effect that was observed. Uh, while getting good uh, embeddings, right? Uh, it's not, I don't know if they might have investigated the uh, um, angles between the vectors obtained and so on. I'm not sure. Uh, Are you suggesting us to use pre trained embeddings? You don't have to. You can start with this and see what the performance is. Uh, no, actually, what I'm saying is you can either use this embedding, you can use pre-trained embedding, you can actually train your own embedding, right? We just saw that it was just a block before your classifier. And the classifier has parameters, this block also has parameters. As long as you can do uh, the same gradient descent to update the parameters of your embedding. Embedding is just, uh, uh, you know, I can represent it as a matrix, right? Which uh, has all these parameters. They're all flexible. I want to choose these parameters such that my final task has good performance, right? I can, I can learn the embedding for my data as well from scratch. I don't have to use pre-trained embeddings. You can use pre-trained embeddings as well where if you keep this fixed, it's like a feature extra extractor. Just like we saw in the images case. Okay, so What's the confusion? Again, I mean, how, how, how is the word embedding learned? How do you train? Yeah, that's what we have skipped, uh, right? Uh, we briefly alluded it to um, here. Right? If it's just a block here, uh, remember your uh, feed forward neural network, right? It had a, um, yeah, uh, the feed forward neural network uh, had, or a CNN had layers, right? Uh, which each layer had parameters, like filter, filters tensor was a parameter for your common layer, right? Uh, so similarly, uh, you can think of this as a matrix, and every time, uh, and let's say in this in this classification example, for any example, uh, W is a matrix with with uh, parameters alpha such that, um, okay, actually to be very very concrete, let's say there are five words here, right? Uh, I'll pick the five five rows of this W matrix. There'll be you know five times 300 parameters, which are which are not numbers anymore, they are variables or, or parameters. Uh, so I'll have five times 1500 that parameters, right? So uh, I'll start with an initial set of parameters. I'll forward propagate all the way to the last value for all my examples. For this example, uh, I can do that. Similarly for some other bunch of five rows, similarly for other sub bunch of five rows and so on. I'll forward propagate, find the last value, and then I can backward propagate so as to update these alphas as well. So each alpha, or, or this this W can also be updated minus learn uh, alpha uh, sorry minus some learning uh, learning rate times loss gradient uh, of loss with respect to uh, this W matrix. 
right? It's just like a matrix that you saw in, in your feed forward, let's say one layer of your feed forward neural network has a matrix W. Similarly, you have a matrix here. Yeah. So, uh, language yeah, it's basically just symbols to, yeah, basically non-numerical data to a classifier is what we're doing, essentially. Okay, so there are a couple of uh, uh, interesting things that you can do uh, uh, with embeddings. So, so you, I mean, let's just pass this code because the use of word representations has become a key uh, secret sauce for the success of many NLP systems in uh, in recent years across uh, various tasks, which we'll not go into, including named entity recognition, part of speech tagging, parsing, semantic role labeling. Uh, so, so word representations are key, and in this, uh, we are just showing how to, uh, uh, you know, basically this is what transfer learning is, right? We we have words, we somehow learned a W for, I mean, learned a W as an assign vectors for each word, right? And we use, let's say, a classifier to classify our five grams to be valid or invalid. Now I can use the same known, I mean, when I when I did that, I could update my parameters of my W such that. I got good classification accuracy. Then I can just reuse the same vectors for some other task. Right? That's the whole concept of transfer learning. That's what we did for uh, even CNNs as well. Right? Just think of this edit, this G uh, as another classifier. Instead of sentiment, I'm classifying something else. Uh, let's say, you know, good English versus bad English or something like that. Right? Uh, you can do that here with the same vector representations. Potentially. Uh, another benefit of uh, having these embeddings is that you can actually train using more than uh, one kind of data. Um, what do I mean by uh, uh, one kind of data? Let's say we have uh, English words and Mandarin words. We can embed both words, in, you know, words in both languages in the same uh, vector space. In the sense, when I say the same vector space, I'm saying uh, vectors for English words is going to be 300 dimensional, vectors for uh, Mandarin words is also going to be uh, 300 dimensional. In fact, they're going to be in the same 300 dimensional space. I mean, once I say a vector is 300 dimensional, it's going to be in the same space. Uh, but uh, we're, going to something, we're going to do something interesting, which is as follows. Uh, so, there will be an embedding function for English words, there will be an embedding function for, let's say, uh, Chinese words, right? Um, while, while training, while training as in while learning the parameters of the W matrix here and the W matrix there, I'm going to impose the following constraint, that words that we know are close <coughs> translation should be close together in the vector space, okay? So, uh, so let's say these two words are close together in, uh, I mean, are literal translations. So their vector should be very close in the uh, vector space. I can impose that constraint, right? I can impose the constraint by just saying, let's say, uh, uh, the difference between the vectors, uh, the norm of the difference between the vectors is uh, very close to zero. So that can be my loss, right? Uh, and then I can backward propagate and learn W, right? Uh, I mean, I can backward propagate and learn W such that uh, whatever vectors I represent for university, whatever vector I represent for university, the same vector is represented for uh, this word. Uh, in in uh, I mean, very close by vector is represented for this word. Okay. Um, and the uh, interesting thing is, once you impose that constraint and learn these embeddings, you'll see that words that we did not know were literal translations will also be translations. That's the additional thing that you're getting because of uh, uh, this uh, embedding two different languages in the same space, okay? So for example, let's say we did not know um, this word uh, and business are translations uh, and we still get the very similar vectors for those two. So now you can kind of uh, extrapolate and see how uh, Google Translate kind of may work, right? I mean, there are a lot of other things which go there, but uh, if it was just word-to-word -word translation, uh, then this is pretty much getting you uh, all the way there. 
right? So for example, if you had uh, these embeddings, then our, for any given test word, you can get the uh, embedded vector, the 300 dimensional vector, look at its neighborhood and see uh, which, uh, and get the uh, words uh, corresponding to the neighborhood. Some of them will be English, some of them will be in the other language. Uh, whichever is in the other language, you just output as the translation, right? Okay. <coughs> So this was, uh, so somebody actually plotted these vectors for the two languages uh, in a paper in uh, uh, 2013 and uh, I don't know whether they are correct, but hopefully they are correct, okay. Um, so this was for two, two sets of words, in the sense of two different vocabularies, I can, I'm, I'm doing something very close to translation now, right. But we can also, uh, uh, now embed very different uh, data, like I said different data, two different uh, languages. Now we are going to embed even different, uh, much more different types of data into the same space. For example, <coughs> images and words, okay. I can map the image of an object uh, near the object word vector and map the image, okay, in this case I am just giving an example, map the image of uh, dog near the dog vector, okay. So let us say I have 10 images of dogs, uh, I can constrain those images to go into a you know have also those those images to also have a 300 dimensional vector representation which are very close to the uh, uh, the word the dog words uh, 300 dimensional representation so so what am i saying uh, basically words will get some vectors right uh, images let's say through a convolutional neural network i'll get the uh, uh, activation vector which is also vector right uh, i just want to constrain i know that these are images of dogs. So when I put in a dog here and images of dogs, I want the vectors to be close by. So that's my loss, right? So I can back propagate and learn these word embeddings and the, the parameters of my deep network to ensure that if there's a dog image and uh, uh, there's a dog here, then they'll get this almost the same vectors, right? Um, so with this, uh, some people kind of try to see, okay, I have, I can embed it, embed the words and the images in, in, in high dimensional space. Now let's say what happens when I uh, input an image which is not there in the, uh, in, in my training data set, okay. It's an image of a cat and cat vector was not there in my training data set. Uh, they show that the cat image is mapped to where the uh, dog vectors are. So uh, even though cat was not there and there's no training about having a cat, uh, you know, there's no word for a cat and there's no cat images, you can still uh, pass the cat word and the cat images uh, through your trained uh, uh, embedding and then the cat will fall in the region where there's dog, right? So these, uh, I guess, these pink color uh, uh, dots are for the cat and they are overlapping the dog area, basically. Anyway, so I'm just uh, trying to give you an idea of what these embeddings can do. The last few slides are about extending the idea of embeddings to dealing with multiple languages and multiple types of data. But you should understand uh, from this section that embeddings are kind of important to get good classification accuracy, let's say, as that's the minimum baseline. Uh, it's just like uh, uh, representing images, the activations would be uh, image embedding. Similarly, for words, you can also have vectors and those are word embeddings, okay? Any questions so far? Uh, TSNE is like uh, PCA, have you ever worked with PCA? So TSNE is just a projection of each vector. So instead of 300 dimension vector, there go, there's going to be a uh, vector uh, beta 1, beta 2, okay? And for let's say for another word, there's going to be another, uh, you know, gamma 1, gamma 2. Uh, if these two vectors are close by in the, uh, uh, high dimension space, then these two vectors will be closed by in the two dimension space. Like if you just plot it as points, right, there are two points, these will be closed by, okay. And the TSNE, some, the technical details of TSNE try to ensure that if the, if the words are very far away, they don't try to uh, capture that, in the sense they need not be far away, uh, there is no constraining, but if they were close, they try to keep the uh, low dimensional representation close by. So it's like uh, some optimization problem they solve, so as to retain some property from the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space, the property being uh, distance between points. This also works on eigenvectors. Yeah. 
you don't work on eigenvectors. It's a com it's framed as an optimization problem. Of course, PCA also can be framed as an optimization problem. Although there is a, a computational way of doing it, instead of doing gradient descent, you can solve PCA by just uh, uh, doing it the SVD operation or whatever matrix factorization, right? Uh, but here, there's a different optimization problem. We can go into the detail uh, offline. Okay, so let's uh, look at RNNs now. Okay, uh, I just tried to kind of motivate with text data as we're not very different from the data we have been seeing in the past four lectures. Once we get the embeddings, you're you are pretty much uh, you know halfway there because from that point onwards, it's all about uh, uh, neural networks now. Okay, so to kind of motivate recurrent neural network which is yet another deep uh, deep learning architecture that you should be aware of uh, you know I'm going to motivate by saying uh, we need this notion of persistence uh, in some tasks so what do I mean by that uh, our thoughts have persistence in the sense we understand the present uh, given what we have seen in the past in the sense you're trying to understand this lecture given that you've come to this like previous four lectures right so Feed forward neural networks and CNNs don't have uh, persistence in, you know, you can probably build in persistence, but naively they don't have persistence in the sense, for example, you can classify every scene in a movie, okay, so let's say the output size is a number of classes, it's fixed, uh, but there's no relation between classifying the first scene or let's say the first frame and the next scene or the next frame. So each is an input by itself, it will get classified as, uh, you know, there's a dog in the scene, maybe next frame there's no dog in the scene, so you'll get those classes but there is no relation between uh, the two classifications, right? Uh, an output sign is all, also fixed in the sense, uh, let's say I fixed, uh, I can only classify the movie scenes as whether there is a dog, whether there is a cat, uh, or whether there is neither of them, okay? There is only three classes, let's say. Then the output size is fixed. It's going to be a three-dimensional score vector and it's going to be translated to uh, one of these labels, right? Uh, so, it's unclear how uh, a CNN can use information from previous scenes. Let's say the dog was running to one, one side in the previous screens, then you can kind of uh, uh, know that in the next frame, uh, there's not going to be any dog. You don't have to freshly start from scratch and try to look for dog features and try to classify that there is no dog, right? So there's, that's the notion of persistence, you know. Um, and architectures called recurrent neural networks uh, address this idea of persistence. And uh, in some parts of the literature, they are uh, kind of shown with loops, as in uh, 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 something like this. So there's an input x at uh, step t, and there's an output x, uh, at step t, let's say represented as ht, and they typically draw a loop, okay? In the sense, when input is passed, uh, so it's basically a gadget uh, which gets an input, passes uh, an output, but it also kind of keeps track of something. So there is uh, uh, another output which is uh, fed back uh, into it, okay? That's that's a diagrammatic representation, but it's actually just, uh, uh, the loop is just for drawing. It's actually a, a deep network which looks like this. Uh, let's uh, try to understand what this image is. Uh, this A can be uh, like a, um, one hidden layer neural feed forward neural network. Okay, that diagram that we have been seeing uh, uh, many times, right? Uh, A is just going to be x as an input, then I'm going to do uh, wx plus b. I'm going to do some nonlinearity, right? Uh, let's say max. Yeah, and this is going to be my H, let's say, one layer of my neural network. But I'm going to also output something else. Uh, in fact, actually, I'm going to output something else. For example, let's say it's, it's the same as H, okay? This and this is the same. It's going to be reused the next time set. So if it is X0, H0, uh, there will be X1 and there will be H1. This H0 will be used again. That's the that's the direction. Uh, that's the that's what the notation is trying to say. Uh, okay. So basically, this this is uh, there is no there is no loop. 
Okay, uh, basically just think of it as a, a, a neural network where you are just replicating uh, uh, the same uh, instance many times, and you you have an output which goes of you know uh, which goes from the previous in, previous step to the next step. Okay. So this is called an unrolled diagram, and this is the actual uh, way to represent a recurrent neural network. Okay. Um, so the sequential or repetitive nature is useful for working with sequences. So uh, sequences of images that you can see in a video, sequences of words that we will see in text, right? Text data. So so this is the architecture. Just like a feedforward neural network uh, had this uh, layered architecture, CNN had this layered architecture. This is the architecture of an RNN. What is this A block? A block can be uh, something like this: <coughs> one layer of a neural network. So, so at any stage, so there are let's say uh, t steps here uh, or stages. At any stage, there's an input, there's an output. Of course, this a block, as I said, is a uh, as a one layer of neural network, so it will have parameters. Let's say w and b. Uh, I'm just represented as theta. Uh, uh, so I've completely specified uh, what the input, output, and parameterization of uh, the block a is, right? Um, So, if you assume uh, uh, a vanilla RNN, uh, which I'm going to show now, uh, and I'm going to assume a single hidden layer, let's say tanish nonlinearity, instead of max of uh, zero comma input, you know, linear transformation of the input, I'm going to say max of uh, sorry, tanish of wx plus b. Okay, uh, I'm going to represent now I'm going to show the RNN in a little bit more detail so let let the dark arrow represent a vector okay and if two dark arrows merge it's a concatenation okay concatenation is different from adding so concatenation is like just appending to the end right and uh, uh, splitting of two dark arrows is copy okay and this uh, green is a neural network layer just like uh, the Stanich layer then this is what uh, vanilla RNN would look like so xt is input, it passes through a tanage, okay, non-linearity. Uh, it's getting, uh, so in, within the block, it's getting an input from the previous uh, step. So this input and this input are concatenated. Uh, they're passing through the non-linearity and there's an output which is coming out and the same output is being fed to the next uh, block. So try to internalize this uh, diagram because we're gonna kind of, uh, try to understand why this diagram makes sense. So what is the motivation for this diagram uh, after a short break of a couple of minutes now? Is that work even when the in the examples you've taken, you are just modifying the same, replacing one word with another. Instead, if it is shuffled across and uh, suppose two three words are changed, like for example, you have said uh, largest is replaced with smallest, or say largest is replaced with some other word. So that's how we are finding this that. You know that if one five gram word is replaced with some other five gram word. Yeah. And I mean, it is randomly ordered. Like for example, here the first. If it doesn't make a proper sentence. We know the true label and it doesn't make a proper sentence. Oh, so the embedding yeah, will all say for example true labels only. All the proper sentences only when mm -hmm. mm -hmm. say color. The word color is coming in first place and here it in another five grammar it's coming in three, in another five grammar it's coming in four. Or oh, location, location. Location of the then, ah, it, that's then not it would not uh, come as a, would it still come in the same neighborhood? No, the word color okay, the color color and what yeah, it doesn't matter where the location is. Won't it? Uh, I mean, how will uh, uh, all the neighborhood because permutations will become huge there, right? How will it be like, like you said, cat and dog? Because they're both animals, you're saying it will come together. No, cat, it will come together because valid sentences which contain cat, valid sentences which will contain dog will have similar words in the neighborhood, right? Cat has four legs, dog has four legs. 
has four legs has four legs will be common okay these are valid sentences and so it will ensure that cat and dog are probably replaceable and therefore they need to have similar vectors that's so, the idea uh, it, it might work for cat and dog say we take a verb it is uh, and, and no, they are the ambiguity and the uh, not ambiguity what is the uh, consecutive words yeah will be huge permutation combinations there right so how will no, no, we are not this? doing anything uh, we are no. not exploring the data in this sense. so how will they come together is what i'm saying is if we have somewhere? i mean so of course this is not a deterministic process if you have large enough data it will happen if you don't have uh, if you have like said just two sentences and you want to learn embeddings it will not happen Okay. Yeah, it's not it's not given that it will be similar. I mean, in the sense they will be close by. Cat and dog will be close by. It's not necessary. But it's observed empirically that they are close by. That's all. Okay. So as the data is huge, then uh, it it will so happen that they. Uh, yes. You will see so many sentences where the context is also captured. Right. There, there is no context. Whether the cat and dog, uh, they are independent. So inner product is zero. Whereas wherever a cat appears, a dog. Uh, dog sentences and the cat sentences will be similar in that task such that the embeddings are close by okay okay yeah i had a couple of questions so when we are doing the uh, cross validation right yeah. so is it sufficient if we just implement a uh, one loop let's say over the entire model that yeah, you just, just break the uh, break over the training. different k folds that we have yeah that's enough right yeah okay and uh, um, Had one more question. Oh yeah, for the MNIST data set, right? Yeah. Uh, so when we're passing it to the linear classifier, yeah. because online when I read about how MNIST is classified, they yeah. use like separate neural networks for the whole thing. They okay. Uh, so you just take I think we are also using a feed-forward neural network yeah. later, right? No, you asked us to use both uh, feed-forward as well as linear. Yeah, right? linear may not perform may not well. Perform well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. Yes. For this. I am not really understand. Like for a first question, you ask us to repeat for a question, right? But if the hidden there is supposed to be ruler, it's not linear. Really. So uh, should I build a functions for the linear? No, you are changing the model, right? Yeah, that that's that's a a little different. We had two. Uh, I had provided two Python notebooks in the first lecture and uh, yeah. the second lecture. Mm-hmm. So the second uh, notebook contains already a two-layer feed-forward neural network. So what I do for that uh, notebook is yeah. just try to split it, the data, right? Uh, so see, question four is just saying that note, pretty much capture what is there in that notebook. In the sense, just reuse that notebook. Yeah. We just have to add the cross-validation step. Okay, that's it. So yeah. In in five, you have to use the second notebook and add the cross-validation step. Again, <laughs> in both you know both two notebooks I gave right. So uh-huh. in each notebook you just have to add the cross validation steps. Okay. Pretty much that's the answer. But yeah. okay, there's so nothing else you. I wrote. I actually built it, but mm-hmm. it's like a lot of. Okay. Nothing, and then I I have no idea why. <laughs> uh, try to ask uh, specific questions in the discussion board. I can answer, okay. or you can come to the. Uh, Uh, office hours. Okay, okay. Or even after this class, if you if you think of something, I can ask. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So many routers. So this code which we have. Yes. So this is cross entropy. Yes. But logistic loss. When I search up, it is giving me the same formula. It is the same formula. It's the same formula. Yes. Okay, and it's L to you have done W square also. Yes. So that is. That is same. That is L two. Reg- this yes. is the L two regularization. Yes, yes, yes. But then what do? We- yeah, so, the key thing was the so this, this, this part. So this is done. This part, right? Oh, we uh, we have to add cross validation. Yes. We have done. And uh, and that still doesn't have this. Accuracy is there, right? No, on the test data there is no test data there. I just have to make it X. So you X have to split the test. Yeah. So the thing is that yeah, X underscore test should not be the same as X underscore train. Yeah, That's yeah, all. I understood that. So I had. Uh, What I have done is, I've used this uh, uh, some sky kit to mm. split uh, split into train and test. Yeah, sure, I'm sure. I'm giving sure. test size as twenty percent. Okay. So what I have to do is, I have to use x underscore test. Yes. And y to underscore test to report the number. That is a change in the code which I have. That I as well as cross validation. Yeah, you have just done x underscore test equal to x. 
Yeah, Where actually I have yeah. my X test. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is basically the cross-validation. No, no, splitting test and train is not cross-validation. So I have to smell it. So this is first like... We we'll get the cross-validation, we should do it offline. We had a data set, we should have set dot seed and do a probability and give the percentage and split it into 20 or 50, 50 or 30, 70. That's first you have to do in 20 yeah. to uh -huh. For that you can use a function called yeah, I use this function. Yeah, yeah. Guys, we need to start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you need regularization in second question? Uh, I don't think so. I don't remember. I mean, just use whatever you feel is the right thing to do. No, because our loss function means square error, you said. It's fine. So, Doesn't I can update the weights according to that error. Yeah, just that error. Okay. Uh, we are back. We are resuming. So, uh, so th this part of the... Uh, Lecture, you know, the next 50 minutes is kind of key. So focus on the RNN structure that we're going to discuss, right? So as I was saying, an RNN is just a graph, you know, in terms of a graphical representation, just like we saw the graphical representation for a feed forward network or a CNN, the graphical representation for a RNN is going to be like this. Uh, if you, if, since there is a rep repeating pattern, we're going to focus on one, one stage or step or time, you know, whatever it is. You know, indexing. Uh, input is xt, it goes through, uh, input is concatenated with the previous uh, uh, blocks output, those two are concatenated, passed through a nonlinearity, and then uh, uh, its output as the current uh, steps output as well as passed on to the next uh, uh, block. Okay. In a sense all these blocks are the same, it's just that they are being reused again and again and so they have the same parameters as well. Okay. In fact, you know, if you really want to see the Python code, I just wrote this. It it's, of course doesn't run, uh, but uh, training an RNN just means finding the parameters, right? For example, what are the parameters in the RNN? Uh, if it's a tan layer, then uh, there's going to be a W and a, and a B, right? So uh, those are the parameters of the RNN, uh, and you want to kind of find the parameters such that it gives rise to a desired behavior. Whatever the behavior is, we're going to get to next. But uh, for now, let's just see how it kind of does a forward pass, right? So what am I doing? Uh, so I'm just uh, uh, defining the length of the uh, H output or, uh, or the thing that is being passed in the next block. Yeah. Uh, what is our objective in this case? Uh, like in the previous cases, we were trying to label the images. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, so here, um, um, so yeah, the objective is still the same. So uh, basically, uh, RNNs are neural network architectures which are going to work on sequences. In the sense, if you had a sequence of words and a sequence of words as the output. So remember, up till now we were saying, let's say sentiment classification. We had sequence of words as input, or the n-gram classification. We had sequence of words as input. But we also we only had like a label as an output, valid, invalid, like three three uh, three score three categories or thousand categories in ImageNet, whatever. There was a fixed output, right? Here we're, we're going to start working on uh, sequences of inputs and sequences of outputs. In the sense, let's say I, I give a sequence of English words, I should be able to create a sequence of uh, French words or a sequence of uh, Chinese words, which, for example, could be a translation. You know, we'll get to that, right? Uh, so, for example, this could be variable length because, uh, you know, sentences are not of the same length. So, this is actually closer to Google Translate than what we saw uh, two slides ago where we were saying, given an English word, I can give you the uh, uh, Chinese word, right? <coughs> so, so, in terms of code, it should be very uh, clear, you know, given that you have already uh, started working on assignment one, uh, I have, uh, let's say, uh, W as a parameter, bias as a parameter. So at each uh, step or each, you know, uh, each of these blocks, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm concatenating, uh, uh, I'm concatenating uh, my H as in the previous H and the current input. I'm multiplying with W, adding a bias and passing through a nonlinearity. And that I'm uh, returning as the output, okay? Um, in the sense, I'm storing that for the next step. So if step is called twice, that that h will be uh, kind of used in the next uh, function call. Okay. So you should also get familiarized with this uh, notion of classes in Python. Okay. 
Um, so is, is this code clear or is it quite confusing? I mean, if there's any confusion, please uh, feel free to ask. Is the, is the block diagram clear? Yeah. Right? This is a concatenation, so then, uh, you know, not an addition. Okay? And this is just a copy. So HT is over here, HT is also here. And, and the same thing follows over here. So, we're going to focus on uh, one toy example of how um, a toy example uh, text uh, application, which is called building a language model. Okay, uh, so what is a language model? It's just a, a probability of a sequence of uh, symbols. Okay, so for example, if I'm building a language model for English, I can say what is the probability of seeing a sequence of um, sequence of words. Okay. If I'm building a character level language model, I'm just asking what is the probability of seeing a sequence of characters. Let's say what is the probability of the in my language. Okay. Uh, what is the probability of seeing uh, t uh, z uh, x? Okay. That's very low probably because if you look at the English corpus, you kind of count the number of times uh, t uh, uh, t z uh, x came. So then it's going to be very low, right? So a language model is just trying to capture the notion of what is the uh, probability of um, a sequence of words or a sequence of symbols uh, appearing okay so, so let's say we want to build a, a language model okay so what what is the uh, point of a language model uh, if I have seen let's say two words uh, then I should be able to predict the third word okay now this is a departure from our classification problems because the third word uh, can be anything, right? Of course, you can say I can do a classification with 50,000 uh, categories as my output classes, <laughs> right? Uh, we'll probably do something similar, but uh, that's that's the probably the, that's that's the use of a, a language model, let's say. You know, but you can do other things. Uh, is that is that clear? What a language model is? Okay. So let's say a character level language model is doing the same thing, but at the level of a character, in a sense seeing the previous uh, characters is saying what is the probability of uh, the next character. So if you have seen TH, then what is the probability of E? It's going to be very high compared to let's say some other, you know, Q, you know, it's going to be very low, right? So, and, and language models that also can allow you to generate uh, text because you can uh, keep on doing this in self loop, right? Uh, I start with, uh, let's say T, what is the next most probable uh, letter? maybe it's H, what is the next most probable letter? It's going to be E. What's the next most probable letter? It's going to be a space. Uh, then uh, what is the next most probable letter? It's going to be some other words the beginning. Let's say most, you know, something like that. Uh, so let's be more precise in this example. So let's say we have a vocabulary of uh, four characters, H, E, L, and O. Then, uh, uh, and let's say that our training sequence is this uh, sequence of uh, letters, okay, H, E, L, L, O. Uh, then we can create four training examples, okay, uh, which are as follows. Uh, like uh, our whatever block, the model block, whether it's an RNN or something else, the block should be, uh, uh, should be able to output E given H in the sense that it should models, uh, model, it should, its parameters should be such that uh, the probability of E appearing after seeing H uh, should be high and similarly probability of seeing L after seeing HE should be high and so on, right? That's what we want to capture. That's what we desire from any model and and precisely what we're going to do is uh, use that RNN. So, uh, so for that we'll create four training examples in the sense uh, not training examples are not the sentences but training examples will be uh, input is H, output is E, input is HE, output is L, in, input is HEL, output is L and so on, okay? so. Inputs are now sequences, not a single, uh, 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 not fixed. Okay, and so let's encode each character as a four-dimensional vector. So from embedding uh, chapter, we uh, kind of saw that there's a very trivial embedding, which is going to be just uh, one-hot encoding. So since we only have four characters in our vocabulary, uh, we'll just uh, have an indicator. Uh, so we'll have a one at the first coordinate for H, 
uh, one at the second coordinate for E, one at the third coordinate for L, and one at the, uh, again, for I guess, O will have one at the fourth coordinate, but we'll get there, okay? So we'll feed each of these vectors in the uh, into the RNN diagram, uh, the architecture that we saw. When I feed H, I'm, I'm I want to maximize the chance that I output E as the output. Okay. Uh, when I I fed H and then I'm feeding E, then you should remember that okay, first time uh, H was uh, input, and now I'm feeding E, so it should maximize the chance of uh, outputting uh, L. Okay, that's the notion of persistence, <coughs> right? I mean, if, if I break off this link, right, these green links, then this is just a one hidden layer type of uh, architecture. There is no relation between uh, this vertical bar, uh, vert these three bars and these three bars, right? So when I pass uh, H E L L, the output should be uh, E L L O. Uh, and whatever be the parameters of the uh, inside the A block, A subscript theta or the W, if it's a tan H layer, there'll be a W and a bias, they should be tuned such that uh, when H is shown, uh, E should be output. Let's say the output is a four dimensional, instead of a score vector, I'm just outputting the H itself, the, the output of the hidden layer, the activations itself. Uh, let's say there are four activations, it's a four dimensional, four neurons there, okay, each one, uh, uh, so, uh, it should be that the second coordinate is high, higher than the uh, uh, other coordinates because E is represented as uh, 1 at the second coordinate and 0 at the other place, right? So is this uh, clear what, what we are deciding from this architecture? You know, what is the input, what is the output, okay? We want, ideally we want 0, 1, 0, 0 here. Or, or something, uh, you know, some scale version of that. We are not getting that with the current parameters. And so we are going to tune the parameters such that it is actually uh, close to 0, 1, 0, 0, for example, right? So I can, I can define a loss which is, okay, whatever is the output, how far is it from E? How far is, it, how far is this output from L? How far is this output from L? And how far is this output from O? I can uh, define that because I have vectors, right? I have a vector for E, I have a vector for this. I can subtract them and define a loss function. What is not clear? Yeah. Just an observation. In the, in the image, it looks like 4 point something should be the highest in the first case. Yeah, this should be the highest, but we want the second coordinate to be the highest because here in my training data, so training data is basically HELL and output is ELLO. That's my XY. Yeah, but I'm just saying that it seems like the fourth one is higher than. Yeah, currently it is higher, but we want this to be higher. Yeah, currently. With some parameter values, it, this is higher. It's just some random numbers that's been put oh. here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we want to tune the parameters of the hidden hidden layer, whatever A block, mm -hmm. which is basically this W and B, right? Uh, uh, such that this number is higher than the remaining three. Ideally, you want that. Here, it's not the case. Neither is it here. Uh, here, it's fine, right? And so it's fine here as well. So ideally, you want. Uh, these green numbers to be higher than all the other numbers in this example, right? So if it, if it can do that for all you know many 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 words, you can imagine that it's it's able to kind of uh, predict the next character, right? If I give a partial input H E, then if you, if I look at the output at this step, uh, it will tell me what's the most plausible next character that will come. The autocomplete stuff in your um, phones, for example. You know, you can think of this as a toy model for that, right? Is there any confusion? Uh, for the sequence, like, uh, when you design this network, based on the input size, you'll have the pairs, right? The number of layers. I mean, I just picked, uh, fixed the layer to be just one, right, here. No, no, I mean, it depends on the word size, right? The size of the word, the... <coughs> Embedding of the word. So here it's, yeah, yeah here it's just four dimensional. Uh, I could have just taken uh, some other dimensional one, but let's say it's 300 dimensional, let's say. So... I mean, you're only processing four at a time. Is that what, that's what I'm saying. 
No, no, if I have a larger word, then I can just repeat the same thing, right? I'll just, I can create, let's say I have a CAT, cat, right? So input will be CAT and output will be uh, AT, right? Yeah. Yeah, output, input will be CA and output will be AT, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, so there is no issue with variable length inputs and variable length outputs. I mean, so technically there is because I have replicated the block four times. If that is your confusion, yeah, here there is an issue with length. Yeah. So I can't just take uh, CAT as an example. I have to take CAT space, uh, uh, maybe next letter as an example. Like because here uh, I need to have input as four characters and output as four characters to kind of keep the network architecture fixed. For every four characters, I need to predict four characters. Roughly, that's what this is capturing. Yeah. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to say is, uh, uh, this you can think of it as, you know, I can pass it through a softmax uh, operation, uh, which is just e to the power uh, scores divided by the sum of the scores, and I can compare that with this uh, e vector, and that's what uh, is precisely the uh, cross entropy loss that you've seen multiple times, right? Uh, and I can just add the cross entropy loss on each, each uh, each step. So cross entropy loss here plus here plus here plus here. So four such terms and that would be my loss. Right? Is the cross entropy loss not clear? Uh, so you can think of this. So forget about the rest of the network, right? So this is just a regular feed forward network, right? Uh, and the output is a bunch of scores. You want to normalize it, so you pass it through a softmax operation which is e to the power scores divided, you know, the right score divided by others, you know, sum of all scores, and you compare it with uh, uh, the true uh, vector, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, which is essentially the same as saying pick the coordinate, pick the, you know, it's a negative log of the probability of the right ground truth, right? That is what this is. So if this is, pick the second coordinate and take that to be the uh, numerator in your Li, right? Is that not clear? I mean, if you have not seen lecture one and two, it will not be clear. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So L data here in this case will have to be each character something, not the batch. Yeah. So uh, yeah, don't worry about L data. I mean, so what I'm saying is, uh, you know, negative log of uh, the probability of. Uh, So this thing is essentially saying I have a I have a score vector whatever that is you know 1.0 uh, 2.2 whatever and I want to compare with 0 1 0 0 this is the true e that's the ground level and this is what the scores which are output with the current parameters comparing this is the same thing as doing this right in terms of the loss and I'm just saying I'm going to do this over the four stages. I'm going to sum over each of the four stages simultaneously. It's okay. I mean, right? This is a this is a static network, right? I mean, in the sense there is nothing changing. This is a graph. I'm comparing this output with the ground label, which is true, which is e, through one such term. I'm comparing this output with the ground label l, one such term. Same thing. Ground this this normalization of this with the l again. That's one such term. Four such terms. That's it. Right? It's not clear. Yeah, yeah. You can think of uh, if you had many, this is just one example, right? If you had hundred such examples of uh, four character strings with four character predictions, then you can do you can define L data and do the backward pass and all that. Yeah, yeah. If once you represent it as a graph, you can do the backward pass uh, just by backdrop. It's just that the parameters here will be shared. In a sense, it's a little same parameter because it's the same block. If you remember, um, it's the same tangent with whatever w comma b. It's just being reused <coughs> again and again. So if you pass gradients to update w, then you just have to take care that uh, there are going to be w being is being used multiple locations. That's all. If you can take care of that, it's fine. Um, 
So when first time uh, L is input, the next, next character should be L. Uh, second time L is input, the next character should be O. That's the notion of persistence, right? Uh, and that's what uh, Aaron, and Aaron is uh, attempting to capture. The notion of uh, that something happened before is being captured. How, uh, okay. Um, so let's, you know, but for character level language modeling, uh, RNNs are not the answer. In fact, you can do something very uh, uh, simple, straightforward, which is you can uh, model it using a maximum, maximum likelihood based method, which just means count the number of times uh, this character appeared given the previous two characters or previous three characters. Okay. Uh, so for example, let's pick a parameter, let's say two. And I'm going to look at all my training data, all uh, character sequences, and see what is the probability of uh, uh, seeing L. Sorry, this should be opposite direction. But what is the probability of seeing L given I've seen H and E? Okay. So there will be some count, right? Uh, I've seen uh, L appear five times after I saw H, and H E, right? So for example, you may have data which, which has H E, a space, and uh, E is or something, like whatever, right? And there will be H E L L O, and there will be H E L P, whatever. There are many such words in your data, let's say. Then you just count the number of times L appeared after seeing uh, L appeared with H E in the number of times you saw H E. That's all. And if you can do this for every three characters in your vocabulary, you'll also have a language model, right? Because for any, if you are, if you've seen two characters in the past, I can tell you what the next character could be, probabilistically, right? Um, so, I'm just trying to give a toy uh, text modeling problem in an RNN and I'm saying that's not the best thing for the RNN. You can actually do something simpler uh, uh, just so that you're not, uh, you know, misguided into thinking that language models are only possible by RNNs and not possible by other conventional methods. I'm just saying that there's a conventional method for this toy problem. Um, okay. And actually the links for simple, uh, you know, 100, 100 line scripts for seeing how these uh, uh, character level language models look like, you know. So you should uh, look at them uh, in your free time. So uh, RNN application categories are, uh, are more than what you could do with just simple classification. So in simple classification, you have a fixed input and a fixed output. Fixed input means uh, whatever is the uh, uh, vector representation you had, uh, and fixed output means uh, you, have, you have prefix number of uh, classes, let's say dogs versus cats, or the 10, ten classes of CIFAR, or something like that. Now, with RNNs, you can do a lot more, because if you remember from the previous slide, the architecture looks something like this, right? Uh, uh, in fact, the architecture probably looked like this, uh, but uh, you can imagine I'm not supplying inputs, and therefore there's no more inputs here. You can imagine I'm not considering the outputs at this point, so I can get rid of the outputs here. You can imagine that I'm only considering a subset of the outputs and a subset of inputs. You know, those are just minor variations, right? And in fact, you can uh, kind of map them uh, to some uh, well-known uh, applications. Like this is an image captioning problem where the input is the image and the output is the text which describes the image. You can actually train an RNN whose input is going to be, uh, I mean, a system whose input is going to be an image and the output is going to be a sequence of words which describes that image. I mean, of course, you should have a training data where you have an image and a bunch of text which describes that image. If once you have the training data, you can create an RNN which, given any image, could potentially give you a textual description of that uh, image, okay? Um, same thing with uh, uh, sentiment analysis. You have a variable length uh, uh, sentiment being expressed in a tweet or a movie review, then uh, you will provide each, let's say, each word in that review as an input, and eventually there has to be some output, you know, which will say whether that sentiment is, uh, you know, positive or negative. Uh, Similarly, for example, machine translation as from, let's say, English to Chinese, you'll, you'll wait till you end, end, get to the end of the sentence in English, and then you need to start uh, uh, making the Chinese translation because it's not a word-to-word -word translation, right? The sentences in Chinese uh, may start, may have a different position for ver verb, uh, pronoun, uh, the object, and so on. So, um, and similarly, uh, um, uh, that. So, so why are we looking at RNNs? As I said, the hypothesis is that the network can connect the past information to the uh, current thing that it's trying to do, let's say, right? Uh, and the question is, can it remember things uh, uh, which have happened a uh, lot, uh, you know, um, 
lot of time ago or have they happened very recently and uh, um, and the answer is it, it depends and that's why we're going to get to uh, LSTMs okay um, so consider uh, model predicting our next word based on previous words so let's say uh, uh, so I've just represented this this model as R so let's say uh, um, it had some text and came to advanced prediction last two words and uh, its prediction is models okay uh, here the immediate preceding words themselves are quite helpful right uh, after advanced predictions mostly you're going to say models not uh, as a school or something right uh, so but contrast this with this setting where uh, you know i went to uic and then uh, after some time i lived in dash okay here the prediction has to be chicago uh, but uh, you, you need a lot more context because uh, you know this happened long time ago let's say um, so it's like saying uh, this output would depend on inputs very close by and this output would depend on inputs very far away right so there has to be some, that persistence which has to be potentially long term or here it's short term right okay uh, the gap between the relevant information the point where it's needed can become unbounded right uh, uic maybe at the beginning of the sentence i say you, you would say i studied at uic and at the end of the sentence i have lived in dash you know if if a model is trying to predict the next word by linearly passing through this text by the time it gets to dash it will not be able to say the chicago right um, and that's what happens with the vanina arunans that we saw uh, uh, just now the tanish thing the simple one layer thing that we were using uh, that type of an, that type of building block for uh, RNN architecture is unable to do that, and so that's why we're going to look at uh, LSTMs, and these are uh, just a special version of RNN. So um, uh, it's called long short term memory uh, network, okay? And these are capable of uh, learning long term dependencies. Okay. So something which happened long time ago, it's still captured somehow. For example, uh, if uh, you know Alice was born uh, in Chicago, and then uh, uh, she went to uh, UIC then uh, the network would somehow know that she is uh, the same as the Alice subject that, ha that happened in a, lo a lot of sentences before okay so that's the context long range context right um, uh, we'll address how LSTMs look right now uh, in okay so they are the same they look very similar to uh, vanilla elements but uh, the repeating module is different. It's a little bit, you know, has three, four operations. We'll sequentially, sequentially look at those three or four operations, and they are very uh, uh, intuitive in nature. So, so hopefully, we'll be able to uh, understand them. So instead of a single neural layer, they'll have four. So instead of just one W comma B pair, they'll have uh, four such W comma B pairs, roughly. Okay, uh, and that's what is represented in this uh, yellow blocks. So let's actually step through uh, uh, these blocks. Uh, so just to remember the notation we have seen uh, yellow blocks means a neural network layer just one layer so a tan h of w x plus b something like that right uh, this is a vector uh, this is concatenation and this is just a copy uh, an additional uh, thing that we are introducing is a point wise operation so if I have two vectors and if I uh, kind of use the circle I am just saying that I am going to multiply the first coordinate of the first vector with the first coordinate of the second vector second coordinate of the second first vector with the second coordinate of the second vector and so on just element wise right okay so let's uh, look at the first uh, you know one of the key notions which is uh, the notion of a cell state because I need to persist previous information I need to have something called a state you can just think of that as a vector so in this stage I have a vector but somehow capturing information from the previous uh, stages or previous steps right so that's called uh, the jargon is called cell state okay uh, in terms of diagrammatic representation we just want to represent it as uh, uh, a horizontal dark line okay and so from the previous uh, uh, block I'll get a CT minus 1 and I'll pass on CT to the next block so this is what is going to capture context like if Alice lived in Chicago and she is uh, you know a student or something like that so she uh, should when I get to the she part uh, the network gets to the she part it should you know the previous blocks which passed uh, the word Alice uh, should kind of uh, ensure that the gender is let's say uh, is female or something like that in, in the cell state or the vector which gets passed on to this point okay um, there are two in between operations we'll get to them later so, so there's this notion of cell state which is capturing long-term context okay so if, if Alice was in Chicago then 
um, the word that she that there's a female uh, subject here is being captured in this uh, at this stage in a vector. That's all. Okay, will be captured eventually. I mean, it's not captured here. We can't force it to capture. By the way, we learn uh, it will capture from the corpus. Um, so why is it faded out? Uh, but anyway, so so this is actually is xt and that is actually ht. If you remember in the vanilla RNN, we had an xt and ht. All I'm saying is that there is an additional ct minus one and ct going back, uh, going horizontally. So if you remember there was a ht minus one and ht going uh, in the diagonal way. We're gonna add an additional uh, 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 horizontal line there. Okay, it'll. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, recreate this diagram so you will it will be more clear next next slides okay so cell state runs uh, straight down uh, uh, the unrolled network straight through the unrolled network if this was the uh, original a block if you remember a theta right cell state uh, is just a vector which think of it as getting going from left to right it's just maybe get may get transformed uh, during while going through a block right it will get transformed because there's two operations which i'm going to detail next uh, it will get transformed and it, it is the one which is supposed to capture the notion of state okay um, uh, lstm uh, the block so there are some operations which will happen to the cell state the block is uh, block can add or remove information to the cell state by regulating uh, what are called gates okay um, so cell state as i said maybe may it's a vector so maybe one coordinate kind of captures whether the subject being talked about in this text is a male or female okay that information can be regulated as in changed uh, uh, by operations within the uh, cell and uh, how are they regulated by we will get to the operations themselves but they are regulated by something called gates and these gates are uh, you know uh, essentially are operations which let information through so they will either let information through or not let information through which just means that I have a vector here I have a vector here because as I said dark bar just represents the vector. Uh, a gate just kind of changes the vector here, uh, uh, but yeah, it's basically just changes the vector here, and that's why it's called a gate. Okay. So mathematically, what's happening? I have a vector here. I have an input to the uh, gate uh, here. Okay. Based on an input, it's gonna kind of uh, multiply element-wise with the in, uh, input vector to give me an output vector. Right. Okay. Is this is this Clear the notion of a gate, yeah. Uh, we are not uh, so we'll attach this uh, gate to the cell state later in a, in a couple of slides. What I'm saying is, I have a cell state, I need to regulate, I, I need to change the cell state uh, in a in within the block to change the cell state. I am now describing a gadget called a gate. Okay, a gate is a generic gadget which is just saying I have a vector. Uh, okay, I should tell it. I have a vector u uh, so I have a vector v here uh, I'm gonna just multiply uh, v with uh, sigma of uh, w plus b okay sigma is uh, just think of it as uh, sigmoid nonlinearity okay uh, it's an element wise operation so I get an input u based on the input I'm gonna create an output which is the output of sigmoids Sigmoid's output is basically uh, zeros and you know some some number between zero comma one, right? Let's say it's all zeros. If I do an element-wise multiplication with b, then output is all zeros. So it's it's like I have forgotten everything, right? So that's intuition. But all I'm trying to cover here is that there is a notion of a gate which can control the vector by doing an element-wise multiplication, which you see in the center here, right? Uh, as I said, the sigmoid output is uh, 0 to 1 and it determines how much of each component is, is being led through. So let's say the sigmoid outputs are all 1, it's saturated sigmoid, all outputs are 1. That's, then f of u comma v is just v because there is no uh, element wise I am multiplying 1 in each coordinate of the v, v vector. So there is no change, v is being output here, right? Is this uh, confusing, clear? No, 
No, no, WU plus B was just used to set the, uh, you know, was the input to the sigmoid. Sigmoid's outputs are ones or zeros. I mean, uh, sorry, some number between one or zero. If it's all ones, then the output is just B. If it's all zeros, the output is all zeros. Somewhere in between, then somewhere in between. Right? It's just a scaling. Yeah. So LSTM has three gates to control the cell state. Okay. Uh, why does it need three gates? Uh, we'll get to that. Okay. And gates look like this. So first gate is going to be forget old information. So I'm getting CT minus one. I want to forget some some par, some coordinates of it. CT minus one is just a vector, right? I want to forget some coordinates of it. Then um, I'm going to create. Uh, I'm going to define what is called a forget gate. Uh, forget gates inputs are going to be ht minus one and xt. Okay, I need to define the u as we saw. U was an input to the uh, input to the uh, input to a gate, right? So here I'm going to define the input to be ht minus one and xt because those are the only variables available to the cell. I mean, available to that block anyway. Ct minus one, ht minus one, and xt. Right? <laughs> only three things. So uh, I'm going to define the input to be this. Output is going to be again. It's a sigmoid uh, nonlinearity, so output is going to be between zero to one. I'm just going to multiply that with ct minus one. So, um, so ht minus one is being ht minus one and xt are being concatenated, passing through this uh, sigmoid unit, and I have this ft vector which gets multiplied with uh, ct later. We'll see that. Okay. So that's the forget old information part. For example, uh, let's say in this car in this task of predicting next word based on all previous ones, the cell state may include the gender of the current subject. And so, basically, this is useful to predict the use of correct pronouns, right? Like, if the gender of the subject was female, she should be the prediction of the, you know, should be the word to be predicted instead of he, right? The RNN should be context dependent, and the context is what the persistence is giving me, right? It should not use he; it should use uh, she. Uh, and but so when a new subject comes, let's say uh, Alice uh, lives in Chicago, and then uh, you know John lives in uh, Boston, then the con then a new subject is entered. Uh, the cell state, state or something, the number should represent now a he, he gender, right? So it needs to forget the previous gender. So that's what this forget gate is trying, is gonna do intuitively. I mean, these are all numbers, right? But intuitively, uh, this is just modulating uh, whether to pass through the CT minus one as it is or to, uh, you know, coordinate wise scale it by, zero, you know, a number between zero to one, right? Now, uh, the next step is remember new information. We have forgotten some previous information potentially using that forget gate. Now we're going to remember new information. Uh, uh, decide, we're going to decide what new information we need to store. Uh, and so for that, there are two ingredients, an input gate uh, and a tan layer. Uh, tanish layer is same as uh, a sigmoid layer. It's just a tanish over there. Okay. Uh, input gate is just deciding which values to update. So I have, I have my cell state. Just like forget was trying to say which numbers should be set to zero, input will say which numbers can be added to the cell state. Okay, which coordinates should be added to the cell state. Um, and the tan layer just creates a vector of new candidate values that can be added to the cell state because you know it's, it's not just a gate that I need to provide. I also need to provide new values. Remember, new information has two parts, right? Remember that's the decision, and then the new information also has to be passed on. So that's why there are two uh, ingredients here. And the way it looks as looks is the follows. Still, we have ht minus one and xt. Uh, I have a sigma, so therefore this is going to be the remember new information uh, gate, which kind of uh, uh, is the output here. And I'm using still ht minus one and xt to create a new candidate cell state. You know the new information. This c, c bar t is going to be the new information, and it is going to regulate whether that new information should be kind of added to the uh, cell state or not. Okay. So the C tilde uh, will be combined uh, with the output of uh, remember this decision of remember new information uh, gate to uh, get this element wise intermediate matrix, uh, which is going to be it uh, element wise with uh, C tilde. Okay. So in the language model example, as I said, I know, add the gender of the new subject to the cell state, and this replaces the old one we are forgetting. So Alice's gender had to be forgotten, and let's say John's gender had to be added. So 
uh, this uh, remember new information gate is saying add that information here okay and the last step is just modify uh, which is this is element wise multiplication so some coordinates are being set to zero uh, potentially right uh, that's uh, that's what's happening with the forgets output and uh, uh, and then an addition is happening with the new information which is modulated by uh, the the new information gate so if the new information says uh, all information should be zeros uh, then the output, then the i vector is fully zero, and nothing is added to the cell state. If if it's all ones, then then everything is added to the cell state. If it's all ones, you could potentially kind of try to make sure that uh, forget is all, forget is all zero, so that everything is forgotten. But you know it's not necessary. Okay. So cell state is modified that way. Okay. And there's one more uh, small uh, thing, which is output. You know, we only modify the cell state, but we also need to create HT, right? Uh, so uh, the modification from CT to uh, HT is that you pass the cell state through a Tanish layer, okay, and then scale it with the sigmoid layer output. Uh, the sigmoid layer decides which parts of the cell state we should output. So that's the third gate, okay, uh, which is uh, diagrammatically illustrated uh, uh, here. So this there used to be a horizontal line which is capturing the cell state, right? So I'll pass it to the tanish layer, and then I'm going to modulate again with my xt and ht minus one. What should actually be output, which is going to be ht and h. Uh, this is just a copy, right? So I'm just deciding this third gate is deciding what should be output at this point, and uh, that's just a and the output is just going to be a transformed version of cell state, right? So in this case. Uh, for example, uh, since it's a new subject, it may output information related to actions. For example, uh, uh, or, you know, subject, you know, output whether the subject is singular or plural or something like that. So, so let's look at all all parts. There's a forget operation. So there's this notion of cell state. I'll, I'm going to use the remaining inputs, which is ht minus one and xt, to first forget some parts of the cell state. Cell state is always a vector. So think of it as some coordinates I'm going to set it to zero. Some coordinates I'm just going to leave it as it is. Some coordinates I'm going to scale it with a number which is between zero comma one, right? Um, this uh, is going to be the remember part with the same inputs. It's going to decide what new information should I add to the cell state, which is c tilde uh, c tilde t, right? Uh, uh, that's the remember part. With the forget and remember part, whatever their outputs are, they are being forget part is just multi multiplying the previous numbers to create some, you know, get rid of some previous information, and the new part is being added to the cell state so that the next block receives the new new context. Okay, and the output is just uh, cell state's transformation uh, regulated by what should actually be output. Okay, that those are the three uh, parts of LSTM, and. Uh, and LSTMs are just variations of uh, many, many uh, things. In, uh, so what the two architectures that we saw are one is the vanilla RNN and one is the LSTM. These are just architectures which have different numbers of parameters and there's some intuition going into uh, why there's a tanish, lay, tanish uh, operation, why there are three gates and so on. That was the intuitive thing that we described. Uh, these were just, uh, you know, it was not concocted in thin air, right? So they tried different, different architectures to kind of represent persistence. Uh, across uh, st steps in a in a uh, in a sequence. Um, so there are many other uh, well-known uh, RNNs. There's something called gated recurrent unit as well. Uh, we'll not get into that at all. Um, and there are of course variations as well. Like uh, you can stack RNNs on top of each other. So right now we saw an architecture which was like this. Uh, 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 the state was going uh, not the state sorry uh, HT was going uh, in, uh, horizontally and HT is for output here. You can uh, stack another layer there, so those HTs can be inputs to the next stack of uh, RNNs. Similarly, you can have another stack of RNNs. So uh, maybe these all have the same parameter. Maybe this 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 layers have different parameters. Actually, these uh, multi-layer RNNs are not very uh, popular in the sense. If they are, they are at most two or three layers because layers don't make sense. What we are trying to capture is persistence. Okay. Uh, layers may make sense in terms of the capacity of the uh, model, uh, but it's not still clear whether you should have a lot, you know, a lot of layer depth here. Okay. Um, 
there are some investigations into which types of these RNN structures make sense. Uh, so for us as a practitioner, we just use a popular architectures and that's why we looked at the LSTM network because LSTM uh, architecture is very famous. It's been implemented uh, already in Keras and TensorFlow uh, and it's uh, empirically seen that it's, it's very good, right? Uh, and again, we are studying RNNs because we want a notion of state uh, or persistence uh, uh, and we also want to wa capture variable length uh, sequences. Um, and we did not uh, look into the training part of embedding pretty much and we also are not going to look at training part of RNNs. But once you have this autodiff uh, software system like a TensorFlow or a Keras, you don't really uh, care about uh, knowing the back propagation details as a practitioner. Of course, you can go in and check how the back propagation happens, uh, but backdrop happens uh, uh, pretty straightforwardly once uh, the software system gets the, uh, gets the computation graph here, right? So, here we just have to suitably define loss. For example, uh, we define the loss as the uh, sum of the cross entropy uh, loss in the character language model there, right? And we just run backward propagation uh, uh, to find the best parameters to fit that language model or something else, uh, right? So, yeah. Uh, so, LSTM uh, applied to IMDB sentiment classification. So, here uh, review input is uh, variable length, right? Uh, uh, input is variable length, you could, you know, input is a bunch of words, sequence of words, output is a sentiment, so it's a single output. Uh, so for this, uh, there are a couple of implementations that you can see, uh, uh, they are very short implementations uh, of, of an LSTM, uh, um, which seems to perform well. You can actually also implement your own, uh, uh, let's say, a static classifier, which kind of collapses all the words, uh, uh, let's say, in the, in the, in the input. Let's say you can get word embeddings. You can maybe add them all up and call that as a feature for that uh, uh, IMDB review and maybe even classify sentiment there. That should be just a linear classifier or a simple uh, um, feed forward classifier. Uh, here they have used LSTMs to show the same thing. Okay. Another thing was, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, you can use CNNs and RNNs together to go from one data type to, the to another. So you could actually go from uh, an image to a text. So image is an input, uh, it goes to a CNN, you get a representation, it's added as an input, you know, H, H minus one, let's say. Uh, and then uh, uh, the first word predicted is straw, next, you know, straw goes as input here, next word predicted is hat, hat goes as input here, and then end is predicted there. And so straw hat is the uh, predicted uh, sequence of text. Of course, you need to have pairs of images and text. You need to have the training data to define a suitable loss here and backpropagate uh, to get the right parameters here and get the right parameters here. I mean, you can use a pre-trained network here. You know, those, all those are architectural decisions, okay? Uh, we'll not go into the detail of how, I mean, it's, it's what I explained, so. So this is another interesting uh, um, research type of uh, RNN network where even if we do not have sequences, we can still use RNNs to process uh, the single fixed input in a sequence. So here, uh, the RNN is processing uh, the input, which is a fixed, image uh, by looking only at parts of it in a sequence. So it's deciding what part to look at next and it's looking at it and uh, um, figuring out, you know, uh, it's, it's, I guess, yeah, it's, it's I guess, uh, doing some image operation here, okay. I, I guess here they're actually showing which parts it's seeing. Um, so you can do this to figure out the image, uh, uh, sorry, the numbers in the image rather than looking at the whole image and at a time classifying it as two or, two or three or 10 or whatever. You can look at parts of the image in a sequential way and then look at and, 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 and define the uh, label. Any questions? It was very uh, fast. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, no questions. Everything is crystal clear. Okay, so in summary, uh, uh, text processing is definitely useful in multiple applications and you will probably have to deal with text in your professional lives. So uh, we just focus on language modeling and this notion of embedding, right? We did not really train an embedding uh, today uh, in the sense how an embedding, good embedding is learned, but we kind of alluded to, alluded to it as saying we can back propagate and still learn the parameters of the embedding, right? Uh, um, and in RNNs, if you train vanilla, vanilla neural networks, uh, uh, 
so sorry uh, if vanilla neural networks is an optimization of functions then training uh, rnns is an optimization of programs as in stateful uh, objects where they kind of capture persistence you know that's the difference with, uh, between the two networks right uh, and we looked at the uh, one particular architecture which is famous uh, uh, in the literature in terms of empirical performance called lstm right um, so that's it for today uh, you can come to tomorrow's office hours if you have questions uh, also use the discussion board yeah. thank you Uh, telling about the previous state and the current state.